Jim. We'll call to order the work session for Thursday, March 3rd. Uh, you see the agenda, it's uh, uh, pretty significant. So we'll go ahead and get started with item number one. Good morning, Mr. Administrator. Good morning. Um, so yes, we have a couple items today. The first item up is a review of the comprehensive plan. Uh, there were some questions that were raised from commissioners. I think they've tried to gather a lot of your questions and answer those, but uh, Rebecca's on her way up. And so she's gonna provide an overview answer any questions that you have and uh, based upon that feedback then we'll set up a timeline of, of bringing it forward to the commission for approval there's one other piece that we're we're going to do later this month is take it to our DCAG group um, and get some of their feedback so um, we'll also have that type of feedback when we actually bring it to you for approval so go ahead Rebecca thank you good morning commissioners uh, as was just explained, I'm here to kind of give an overview of the key changes associated with this update to our comprehensive plan. So just for a little bit of background, um, why we took this effort on is because comprehensive plans are uh, reviewed over as a long-term document, reviewed every eight to 10 years to make sure it's still moving in the direction we want our programs to uh, be consistent with and, and achieving what we want for the community. The last major update happened back in 2008, so we uh, wanted to make sure we were moving in the right direction with our policies. And of course, um, there were some other just formatting needs and um, the need to address regulatory language that doesn't belong in this document as it's a policy document. And of course, there are changing needs. Our population continues to grow. We have to address uh, issues such as affordable housing and how do we plan for sea level rise and so forth. So we wanted to, the plan to, to address those needs. So a comprehensive plan for each local jurisdiction is, state, uh, is mandated by state statute. Um, and we are influenced of, by uh, establishing and meeting the needs of state statutes for different topics. How do we address housing, transportation, et cetera? That's determined um, by the state. We're also guided by our partner with Fort Pinellas. Uh, we're guided by their land use plan and, and their transportation plan. The countywide plan sets policies that we have to be consistent with. And of course, we have our own county initiatives um, and goals that we're trying to achieve. And all the policies within the comprehensive plan um, need to meet those needs. We had uh, different touch points with the community when we were first starting this process. We wanted to establish those guiding principles by which the policies uh, were consistent. And so we had an effort of um, community open houses and different presentations. We set up at libraries to be able to share it with the community. We had a, a website created at the time um, and, and online surveys to help gather input and, and determine um, if the community agreed with these guiding principles. And we also brought it to the board uh, to make sure we want it was okay to move forward with those guiding pr principles in place. We, um, as uh, the county, worked across departments to review the policies and update them. Um, and when we got to this draft plan that you've had the opportunity to look at, we wanted to bring it to the public again and make sure that they had the chance to review it and comment on it um, as they see fit. So we launched a specific website that um, shares the, the comprehensive plan. And we had the opportunity for comments to come in through that website, as well as holding some public webinars and uh, communicating with our different um, neighborhood associations and municipalities and, and so forth uh, to give them the opportunity to comment. So to get into the document, these are the different chapters of the document. Again, um, the topics of which are primarily guided by state statute. When we looked at and reviewed the policies, we wanted to make sure we took a systematic approach, meaning understanding the relationship across the different chapters, how they interact together, and helping us to focus um, our policies based on that. As well as looking at health in all policies, are we producing um, positive public health outcomes uh, from what we're trying to achieve? Um, as well as we had an equity lens, and really what we mean by that is, as we uh, make decisions, we need to understand where there are gaps in access to resources, um, and are we making decisions um, based on that full information? So to get into some of the key changes by chapter, uh, for future land use, one of, the, one of the key changes is really identifying how we want to focus the growth. We know we're growing as a population. How do we want to, to address that? So we really wanted to focus growth in activity centers and mixed use corridors. And that's a shift a little bit from what we refer to now as sector planning. And that's essentially 
um, just saying that's more directly determine how we want to uh, grow out, uh, build out. And that is allowing for areas that infrastructure can support development and redevelopment, that we're creating walkable communities, that we're creating a density that can support transit, that we have proximity of uses for convenience of our residents and workers. Um, and so that's really what those types of uh, centers and corridors can do. We have a new land use category um, called Plan Redevelopment District, which is in line with that, but allows for a transition between low and high density areas. So really, again, a lot of these issues focus um, around how do we want to focus our development. Uh, we also want to create this community planning process that uh, allows us to consistently look at different areas of the community. Um, it's, we scale the process to the, to the size of the area we're planning for, but we want to introduce that process. Um, we also removed some direct um, policies that talk, talked about uh, US 19 corridor or the fixed guideway transit or what have you. And the reason for that is because we, the comprehensive plan is really intended to say, yes, we support corridor planning, but we're not gonna be listing every corridor that we're planning for in the comprehensive plan, but the, the plan really guides the fact that you can look at these types of activities and move forward with that. We also call, uh, newly call for a food access strategic plan. It's really trying to understand where there are gaps in the system, uh, what communities have uh, minimum access to healthy foods. So how do we make recommendations to, to improve that situation? A big part of uh, land use is connected to housing as well, and how do we improve our housing stock, make sure we're addressing affordable housing needs, and there are land use decisions like addressing missing middle, so, or uh, really the, those uh, types of homes that may not be in place today that expand our housing stock and options. We also wanted to make uh, the ability to address affordable housing a little bit more achievable. And currently in the plan, uh, we have a, a cap for looking at an, a density bonus incentive. While we still want to look at that incentive and we mentioned the density bonus, we've removed that cap to allow our land development code to really determine what are the different situations where you would have different levels of, of density allowable for affordable housing. And so a lot of the incentives that we're proposing or recommending, we should say, to look at um, really would be carried out through those implementing tools like the Land Development Code. And so again, connected to housing, we really stress the coordination um, with our municipal partners. How do we achieve and address the issue countywide? And so we call out the, the, the strategy of participating in the countywide housing strategy. Uh, and again, uh, other incentives are addressed in the housing section. How do we help off offset costs? So all of these are the things that kind of direct us for what should we be looking at and how it's carried out happens outside of the comprehensive plan. Um, and I'll just mention that we, we remove some of the specific um, entities like a community land trust or, or uh, other items, but it, it's really to make sure that the policies support what those things are trying to achieve but we don't feel the need to call them out within the plan itself. Before you go on to the next page. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the, how much of in depth do you go on each section as far as uh, recommendations or actually specific policy items? Or I, I'm thinking specifically on the food access yeah. strategic plan um, and our food desert areas yeah. and, and how we address those, whether it's zoning or, or uh, variance recommended, how, kind of yeah. give me a little bit more meat on that bone. Sure, so the intention is really, the way it's drafted is to understand initially where the issues are, where are the gaps, what, you know, what are the needs that need to be filled. So the intention of the strategic plan is to assess that and then make the recommendations. So it's really working with um, partners within, within the county and organiz organizations within the county to understand what the need is and then looking at best practices and other things that have happened. So the plan itself doesn't make the specific recommendations. Okay, that's and, where I was going. Yeah, I think the, the good piece to remember here, this is a 10-year a plan. And so if you call out an issue, then there's specific strategies that will be developed um, in a different document, like, for instance, a food security document or something that's more specific to the different areas of the county that can be adjusted over time. You don't have to amend your comprehensive right. plan each time you look at a different area. And that's and we've seen it in other issues, but with this one it was it was new, and so I, I wanted to just kind of get a better frame for it. Thank you. Thank you. 
similar question about the housing strategy. So sure. will we have a separate housing yeah. strategy that we can amend if we, because I think we're, I mean, we know we're in a crisis right now and we may be, need to be a bit more nimble than we have been, <laughs> you know, yeah. and to look at some creative things. Um, so I just want to make sure that this is not it, it's presenting exact, a barrier to any of that. Yeah, it's exactly that. It says who, who are, we should be working with our partners to create this overall strategy. And it's really, again, the implementation tools, whether it's an ordinance or a land development code regulation or so forth, that really sets the specifics of any of these actions. Okay. But, okay. Okay, so um, in our economic prosperity section, we really, um, we expanded uh, some of the language to, again, look at those areas of the community that may be underserved, uh, want to protect small businesses. Uh, of course, we're continuing to um, assess the need for target industry and how do we attract them? Uh, how do we make a business climate um, that is uh, welcoming to different levels of our businesses, looking at, uh, it directs us to look at um, uh, the you know potential barriers that we have in place and how do we address those. So one of the big things that we've done is add to our goal the, the idea of equity. And what that means here essentially is, um, are, do we have the information in place to, to understand that, and guide our decisions um, that we're not impacting specific communities or specific businesses or specific areas of the county with the decisions and programs that we make. Um, so one of the things I, I want to highlight here is that we're, we're proposing an economic prosperity strategic plan. And really it's to start with that data and that analysis and then make recommendations for the different, uh, the different elements of our local economy. Again, whether it's target industry, workforce training, how do we support our small businesses in different areas of, of the community. Uh, and then one other thing I'll mention here because it, it, it's, um, uh, it goes in line with what the role of the comprehensive plan is, is that we're removing, um, I believe there was a specific jobs target uh, identified in the plan. Metrics will be a big part of any of the programs that we do, but the specific, we don't want to go through a comp plan amendment if we want to change the specific target. So that was removed from the plan itself. So for transportation, one of the key shifts is uh, while we still very much are, as we plan our transportation system, we look at efficiency, but we really stressed the, uh, the notion of looking at safety as our number one priority. So we identify policies consistent with Vision Zero or Safe Streets Pinellas where we're trying to limit traffic related um, injuries or fatalities and how do we reduce that um, and how do we plan our network while considering safety as a key issue. Uh, we also are looking at supporting transit. How do we um, plan our areas in ways that can, can support additional transit and improve that system? Uh, lowering vehicle, vehicle miles traveled. And th this is an example of um, one of those cross issues that goes across different chapters. You want to lower vehicle miles travel by um, providing different opportunities for people to move around the county, whether it's sidewalks or, or, or bike lanes or trails or, or what have you. Um, to t take cars off the road. Well, that also is a natural resource issue and how do we um, reduce emissions associated with that as well. So it sets strategies to look at those things. Um, also here, and this is, uh, this is an example of what we've done um, at different points in the document, is that we removed old uh, DOT standards associated with um, some of the uh, uh, roadway requirements. There, Again, those are regulatory tools, so they don't belong in the comprehensive plan, but we still use and recommend this context-specific approach. How do we look at the facilities for the specific area we're looking at, and what are the right facilities for that area, and we'll set the standards associated with that. Um, we also um, look at uh, how do we plan for the future? Are there technologies? As we build out our infrastructure, um, can we support alternative modes and technologies in that process? So moving on to natural resource and resources and conservation, uh, what I'd like to highlight here is something I believe you've seen already, and it supports the creation and implementation of a sustainability and resiliency action plan for the county, um, looking at a, a cross section of, of environmental issues and other issues that can support resiliency of the county, and that is identified um, as, a, as a strategy to utilize in the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, we also look at an urban forestry master plan that should be implemented, looking at our tree canopy system and which affects a number of things, whether it's air quality or stormwater runoff or um, heat island situations. So essentially, let's look at what the issues are through this master plan and make recommendations of how we can address that. And then we look at um, county facilities and, and, and our fleet uh, and seeing how can we move into the future to be more um, environmentally sound with our decisions there. So for coastal management, um, a, our goal continues to be reducing risk and, and limiting uh, impacts. Uh, but for the goal language itself, we've added reduced risk from sea level rise, flash floods, and climate-related impacts. So that kind of guides a lot of the policies that are in the document. Uh, we um, were working with emergency management, and they recommended that we have um, a 50-hour estimate for evac times um, during hurricane or storm events. Uh, in the current plan, it's, it simply says reduce from 55 hours. And it also set an unrealistic target of 16 hours. Uh, so working with emergency management, they recommended that it be 50 hours consistent with a regional statewide report that had come out in 2020. Um, and essentially how that works is that, that 50 hours is backed into. Um, so when a storm event is, is happening, they work backward from when they expect that to happen, when tropical force winds will be in the county, and they work backwards to determine that 50 hours. And of course, the board has the opportunity or is required to um, say when that 50 hour notice to the public occurs. Um, we also um, remove uh, policies associated with uh, notifying uh, RV parks and transient accommodations and such. Uh, from this comprehensive plan because that's something that's addressed in the county code. Um, so getting into our coastal high hazard area or in a coastal storm area, a consistent uh, effort throughout the document is to say use the latest and greatest information to guide our decisions. Um, so we've done that for the coastal high hazard area. Also just use the latest modeling, what's available to us that will help uh, determine what that boundary is. Um, and so for the coastal high hazard area essentially explains where there's flooding impacts uh, from hurricane events or storm events. And so we as a county, as a peninsula, we have other areas that are flooded beyond that boundary. And so we've created a coastal storm area to further protect that. One thing that we considered is adding an additional zone or a coastal A zone. Um, that has just recently been mapped for the first time because it has, imp it has potential impacts from flooding. We haven't fully been able to uh, understand the impact on what properties are affected by that additional boundary. So we're not moving forward with that just yet, even though we considered that. Uh, but it is something that we'll probably bring to you in the future as we further understand the impact associated with expanding the definition of what the coastal storm area is. Uh, we also recommend um, different items um, and strategies to protect our public infrastructure uh, from sea level rise and climate events. So in the surface water management section, um, big thing is just calling out the implementation of a stormwater manual. It certainly doesn't identify the specifics of what has to be in it, but it sets up the notion that we should be implementing a manual that provides alternatives to treatment and so forth. Um, so any changes that uh, we as a community would, or a county would make to that manual, again, happens outside of the comprehensive plan. In the recreation, open space, and culture section, um, some of the big changes really just has to do with, again, adding that equity approach, identifying where there are gaps in our system, and how do we um, potentially address those situations. We set up criteria for when uh, we de determine how we want to um, pursue land acquisition, uh, looking at environmental concerns, again, gaps in the system, are we connecting those, et cetera. Um, and we expand our historical and cultural resource protection policies. And it has a lot to do with tracking and documentation of our resources. And there's also a strategy to really identify when it's the appropriate time to require an archeological survey as, as we redevelop. So in our potable water and wastewater section, um, we take away, again, those items that may be addressed elsewhere, like in the building code. Um, and one of the big changes is really just saying, let's look at the vulnerability of our, our infrastructure and determine um, how we can plan for that. 
Um, and it does remove one policy that states that the board is the one is the entity that sets the rate the water rates. Um, but the main reason why we remove that is because that is specifically addressed in the county code in the utilities section, and it sets up that responsibility. So it really does not belong in the comprehensive plan itself. For the solid waste section, um, it identifies our advisory group, which is the technical management committee, um, which is really the county communicating and, and coordinating with our municipal partners and how collection occurs. It adds the policy to implement our solid waste master plan, which addresses programmatic things and, and will make recommendations possibly to, um, to amend our county code to meet um, our desire to go towards zero waste. Uh, it removes policies relating to franchise collection contracts. Now, I will. I, I do want to make the point that it doesn't preclude our ability to use that tool. That is a tool that we still have the opportunity to use, although our our solid waste team really does not pursue that because it's a very complex um, process. So because it's not something that they really identify as something they would uh, choose to move forward with, they said, let's take it out of the comprehensive plan as long as we're we're sure that it is something we could pursue if we so choose. Uh, we also removed the hazmat response because that's a federal um, action. It's uh, FDEP is the one who would respond to um, the, those types of situations. It's not our, our uh, purview. And similarly, um, we removed a legal disposal response saying that our solid waste team uh, is responsible for that. Um, and that's because they are not Right now, the, the process that we use is contracting with Keep Pinellas Beautiful, and we that's how these actions are carried out. Um, so it, again, doesn't preclude things from happening, but it doesn't, it, it more uh, appropriately reflects what's occurring with our team. Um, and it also identifies um, looking at environmentally sound collection and disposal, of course, being fiscally sound, having fiscally sound management, it removes specific fees um, from the document. And the reason for that is because they want to have the opportunity to, to pursue a number of different fees. And they don't want it to seem as though it's lim the comp plan is limiting the opportunities for fees. Uh, and similarly, as I mentioned in, in um, a different chapter, we're looking at how um, is our uh, infrastructure uh, impacted and vulnerable, and so it's limiting and moving um, solid waste facilities outside of the coastal high hazard area. So our lifelong learning section is our, currently our public facilities chapter, and really what this does, it, it keeps um, the school district interlocal agreement or reflects that, uh, but it expands our conversation by saying, how do we uh, ensure access for our community to training resources and to um, our facilities and different opportunities for our community to have access. And in our governance section, again, that's a new title. It incorporates a number of our existing chapters, including intergovernmental coordination, our capital improvements element, and the recently adopted uh, property rights element. All of that would be housed within this governance section. We've added a new goal to reflect the desire for to uh, address decisions looking at healthy outcomes for our community. So it has a public health goal as well. Um, and one thing I want to identify here is that it removes the specific amount associated with our tourist tax collection. It still identifies that tax. But if, similarly, if, if that percentage happens to change over time, you don't want to have to go back into the comprehensive plan document to amend it. Uh, and one, uh, one other um, note there also is that it adds a strategy to say, let's look at a number of different funding sources of how we could support our transportation system. Before you. Please. <laughs> the ads policies, the equitable access to learning opportunities. Yeah. Is that basically we're just uh, referring to the school districts completely? Or when we talk about access, are we also talking about libraries? 100%. Yeah. So. Thank you for that. It, it does. It talks about how do we coordinate with our partners. It's the school district. It's our businesses understanding what kind of needs they have for their for their industries. It's working with uh, our libraries and our community centers and organizations. So it's really the the approach is really that coordination piece. So it's more the core. It's not actually. And again, I I don't mean to harp on the specifics, no but that that uh, in other plans I've seen other entities take, we want to have a community park within X miles of every. Yeah, no, again, it's not the specific 
uh, it's not the specific actions that would happen out of the policy. It's a policy policy that says look at these things okay. and make recommendations of how we can improve access. Very good. All right. Thank you. And so that, that's the general summary. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just want to share our upcoming schedule. So as mentioned earlier, we will be meeting with our developer advisory group at the end of this month. I believe it's March 25th. And then we're hoping to come back with the transmittal hearing uh, this spring. And then uh, by the end of the year, hopefully in fall, we would go for adoption after the state comments have come in and we're able to address those. Questions? Commissioner Seal. That working? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I did have a chance to um, meet with Rebecca and to go over a lot of my questions, but I still have um, maybe two areas that I'm a little, um, three areas that I'm concerned about. And one would probably have to go back to forward Pinellas. But if safety is going to be the overarching um, criteria and plan for the county. Um, if you look at the bike lanes that are proposed and that exist, I think we really need to take a good look at it because I think there's areas where it's not safe to put a bike, say on US 19, um, for instance. And um, so I think we probably should um, ask Forward Pinellas to take a better look at that with the safety lens of where is it appropriate to have bike lanes on what kind of roads. And so um, wanted to bring that up. And then the other thing, and um, Commissioner Flowers, you're on the homeless leadership group. Um, one of the um, strategies is to provide opportunities for the through the county for emergency shelters. And when I was on the Homeless Leadership Board, I know it was a housing first approach that was being taken, that we should be looking for permanent housing. Um, emergency shelters, in my opinion, and if you talk with the staff, don't really address homelessness. And so I hesitate to have this being one of our key strategies. Instead, I think we should be talking about, and Rebecca did respond to that, that housing first could be put into this, which I think would follow, you know, what we're trying to accomplish in Pinellas County. Sorry, keep forgetting to push my button. Good observation. We have talked about this a lot. As a matter of fact, I have a board meeting tomorrow, so I'll bring up um, the, the concern. Um, we've talked a lot about um, the level of housing and how we prioritize based on the funding that we get, whether it's for rapid rehousing, whether it's for transitional housing or emergency housing. So I will certainly uh, bring that up tomorrow at our board meeting. We, as far as I've seen since I've been on that board, are looking towards housing permanency, but there are so many things that some of those persons require in between that permanency housing at that point is not attainable mm -hmm. because they don't have some of the um, wraparound services needed in order for them to um, move in that direction at that point. But I will certainly bring that up. That's a good point. Thank you for sharing. Well, um, it's actually maybe not as much of where your board needs to go as to what the county decides to put in our comp plan. And if housing first strategy really is the strategy that the homeless leadership group is suggesting, then I think that's what we should be putting in in our comp plan. Yeah. So, um, the other thing that um, um, I had brought up with her was about um, transfer development rights. And that is, um, I guess in the process, I just, I didn't realize that, that Ford Pinellas was gonna be looking at TDRs, policies and so on. And it, I think that's something that we need to get done sooner than later because um, we all experienced the golf course threats over the last few years. And you know, we, while we have some policies um, to protect golf courses, I think that we need to be um, moving on that quickly so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where, um, find ourselves in a situation. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Long. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I totally, really, I just wanted to respond to your comments, Commissioner Steele, because I totally agree with both of the last couple items that you brought forward. And as it relates to the bike lanes, I also think that they are way too narrow. Uh, considering the high traffic volume that we have on some of the roads where you have those bike lanes, I mean, that's just an accident waiting to happen, and more and more you hear about those accidents, and they're, um, they're causing deaths. So I think as we move forward, put that in our comp plan, there ought to be something about the width, if that's appropriate. Um, secondly, as it relates to the Housing First model, I remember when I served on the Homeless Leadership Board, that was beginning to be a national recommendation, not just statewide or within our county. And I think it's very remiss for us as a county commission, frankly, not to put that in our plan and be very focused on it because it's a long way to go from homelessness, homeless to permanent housing, and if you don't focus on that first, it's really hard to get those people off the street permanently. My opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner, for bringing that to the board's attention tomorrow. That's all I have at the moment. And that, by the way, that's a lot of information at a very <laughs> fast speed. I hope we're going to see it more than once, Barry. Um, you are, and these are these are good areas to bring up. You know, it's, and specifically with the bike lanes, I, I think you're you're going to see as you see new bike lanes that's different than the existing infrastructure, and we have bike lanes that I think that's the 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 challenge and the reason they want to put. And I'll look at the language and, and work with staff on that. Um, is how do you convert from what you have to something that's better? You know, I I would never ride a bike down Almerton in that bike lane, <laughs> you know? And and um, and I think that that's the, um, that's the concern. And so they wanna do that through a safety lens as they make improvements. And so that's the comprehensive plan piece versus the implementation piece. And we've got the first set in the strategy, but we'll go back and look at the language to reflect what, what you've said here and, and see if we can come back to something better. We have plenty of time to make amendments to this. Again, we're looking at the adoption in the fall, so. Um, Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, and I would just, uh, I'm sure Witt would have something to say about this, but <laughs> when we're developing bike lanes, in some places in St. Pete, we put bike lanes in that seem very safe for the bikes, but then they block uh, uh, the sight lines for drivers. And I think that that makes it just as dangerous as not having a, a bike lane at all. Um, you know, if you've got these great big things in the middle of the street and you can't see that bike coming and the bikes don't stop, uh, particularly in St. Pete, I think that's, a, that's an issue. Um, as far as the housing first goes, I would certainly like to see that in our plan, but I don't think that's the only strategy that we need to support. And as somebody who is in human services for 40 years, I can tell you that even at the federal level, that will change within the next five or 10 years, and there'll be some totally other strategy that they want to follow. So this is a 10-year plan. Commissioner Seal. Um, you know, just going back again to the bike strategy, um, it did come up at Ford Pinellas about converting some of the access roads along US-19. and. We as a board did push back at that, and I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that, that we did not think that that was probably, um, the access roads play a very important role along US 19 and that whole corridor. So, um, and also, you know, you know, going back, way back in history, you know, and the trailways are also listed in the, um, in the comp plan. and. You know, our goal was to really create the Duke Energy Trail and the Fred Marquis Trail and other trailways in order to really address the bike um, usage within the county. And so um, the only other question that occurred to me is, I, and I meant to ask it earlier, but the incentives for economic development. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned, and I, I don't know the specificity of it, but you said it would, should be 
used in urban areas. Yeah, there, it's not just urban areas. It's just one of the items that we're saying that understanding, um, understanding uh, what incentives can help bring business in, generally speaking, but also we need to look at how do we invest in areas that may um, have, are underserved right now or are subject to possibly displacing businesses or putting businesses uh, out of business altogether and understanding how we can support uh, that, those communities as well. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to offer to Barry, when you're talking with staff about improving the bike lanes, you might want to ask them to look at how they manage to do that in the Netherlands, because they have whole streets that are dedicated to uh, bicycles at different times of the day. It's really interesting how they move the traffic there. And let's not forget that while they're moving traffic within the city, I'm specifically referring in this example in Amsterdam, they are also <laughs> crossing a lot of water areas, bridges and stuff like that on bikes. So it can be done, it just takes a while and a lot of determination. But just an observation, um, I did get run over by a bike when I was there. <laughs> oh my, what were you doing? <laughs> no, I mean, you really have to watch well, constantly yeah. because they travel on, you know, similar lanes as a sidewalk. And so you're trying to cross across a bike lane and um, I forgot to look and I got run over. <laughs> like a, a messenger in New York City. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, yeah, I don't think you have to go to the Netherlands to get run over by bike. We can go to, right here in Pinellas County. Um, yeah, and I, I like the, the emphasis on the, on the bike lanes and the bike safety and uh, whether it's on our roads, whether it's on our trails. Um, clearly, that's becoming a, a huge use of, of folks, whether they're out for leisure, for fun, going to an event, or going to work. So. Uh, the more we the, the more we focus on on bike safety, the better. I, I'm still not sure why we ever would put a bike lane on these major roads like Almerton or you know I I certainly would be on the sidewalk and you know watching for pedestrians. But um, and the only the only other thing you all have touched on a few things. I'm glad you said something about frontage roads. I think that was something I wanted to say also. But under uh, stresses investment and in infrastructure, I think we're going to have some discussion coming up shortly. But stressing sound investment in infrastructure, I think, is a really important distinction because we're going to find out in conversation shortly, but we've been talking about it, how we are using dollars for a bad road, a bad mile of road and a good road mile. So I think it, it differs. So we have to be very cognizant of using those few dollars that we do have that the citizens have voted on over and over for infrastructure using it wisely and I think that's important and I'm glad we're going to be having that brief discussion albeit I'm not sure I like where it's going necessarily but I like the idea that we're having the discussion so thank you all right Thank you very much. That was a lot of, I mean, obviously staff's put a lot of work into Absolutely. getting this update done, so um, more to come. So the, the next piece, the transportation update, um, normally we come in, you know, we, we have specific presentations and recommendations about where to go, and um, that's not this discussion. You, you specifically asked for this discussion at the strategic plan. And so the way we've kind of broken it down is I've asked Witt to come up and talk about countywide you know, wide issues. Um, Brad Miller's here, and, and so we ha I, I really want to get a sense. I don't need a decision today, but you know, we're in the beginning throes of putting together our 2023 budget, believe it or not, and um, budget hearings coming up, and so some decisions are going to be made over the next several months, and I need to get a sense from the commission as a whole about where you want me to go with some of this stuff. Um, you know, uh, Commissioner Seal brought up some different revenue options and things like that. Do you want us to pursue those? you want us to maintain? Um, we're going to talk about different levels of service. We're going to talk about different policies in terms of what we provide and areas we would want to fund and areas that you may not want to fund. And so today I'm looking for a sense, not a decision. Based upon that direction, then we'll go back and we'll prepare ideas, options, and policies that we can bring back to you later this spring or early summer as part of the budget process. Um, so that's kind of how we've set it up. 
I'm not sure if I hit all of the areas because I think we have about, we have seven commissioners and about 10 different ideas about transportation. And so um, that was the reason we kind of, um, I didn't want to get too many people involved simply um, for the for the purpose of listening to you and having that type of discussion. And I know um, uh, Kelly's out today, but Tom Washburn is going to uh, give the, the piece on just some of our basic infrastructure. Last year, you know, we come to you and we said, you know, we've got an issue with sidewalks. And we, and as you saw, we were not maintaining our, our basic infrastructure. Well, as we, as and I, I told you at that time, we were, we wanted to look at this in roads too, because we've taken the amount of money that we have available and, and make the most of that money. That's not necessarily a strategy of maintaining your infrastructure at a level of service that's acceptable. And we've never had that conversation. So transportation's, you know, Public Works has put a lot of work into kind of doing that assessment. And so you'll see some stuff today that'll just be an introduction to we're not at the level we need. And again, it's how much money are we willing to spend at what level of service? And so those are some policy things. So we'll kick it off with that. And then we'll turn it over uh, to WIT to kind of give you a broader overview and from a planning standpoint. Um, I also wanted to introduce uh, Dan um, Marable, who is the deputy director. He's here also. You've met him before, but um, but only a couple times. And with Kelly um, out, they, they've been doing a really good job of, of pulling all this together and getting this presentation re re uh, ready. So um, with that, I'll just you know, kick it over to Tom, and uh, we'll get going. It is if you push the button. <laughs> okay. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Happy to be here. And uh, thanks for the introduction, Barry. Um, I also want to introduce Dave Duranza. He's with us here today. Uh, he's our section manager for the bridge and, and roadway section within Public Works. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that it takes all three of us to fill in for Kelly today. So uh, uh, between the three of us, hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, just wanted to, to start off by... Uh, Again, saying this is informational in nature. It's, it's as we're leading into the budget sessions. Uh, this is intended to be an overview of our transportation systems and then what we've identified as, as the public works funding priorities uh, moving forward. So I'll start out at a, at a big picture view just to give you a sense of what the county owns, operates, and maintains as far as the transportation infrastructure that totals almost $5 billion. Um, and it's, in addition to the infrastructure that you're aware of, like the, the pavement and the sidewalks and the signals, it also includes our support services for mowing of the right-of-way, the landscape services, the drainage work that takes place in maintaining the ditches and the, uh, and the pipes to make sure that the water stays off of, of the pavement as much as possible. As Barry said, the priorities for us over the last couple of years have been the sidewalks and our pavement management program. Um, I'll be happy to give you an update here in a minute on where we are with the sidewalk and the funding that you provided last year. But for our sidewalks, the, the goal is to make sure they're safe, that they're ADA compliant, so that we're eliminating our trip and fall hazards, um, and also that we're creating connections to the, to the sidewalk network. And then as you'll see as we get into the discussion on the pavement management, uh, the focus for all of our services is on sustainability, making sure that we can maintain what we build and what we, what we have in the field. So just a, a brief overview on our transportation assets. Just as a reminder, this is a couple slides here. This is our traffic items, so the street lights, all of our ITS equipment. Um, interesting to note that we operate and maintain almost 450 traffic signals, and it's, it's always interesting to me that we maintain almost 43,000 traffic signs uh, in the field. And then this next slide is actually the roadway elements. So the, the brick and mortar part of our transportation system. So our bridges, our, our box culverts, all of our, our handrails. Uh, we maintain almost 1,100 miles of sidewalk. We maintain almost 2,600 miles of, of uh, or over 2,600 miles of, of pavement. Uh, just a, a quick uh, overview on our operating budget. It's funded almost primarily through the Transportation Trust Fund. Uh, you've seen this before um, over the last couple of years as we've talked about the, the, uh, the concerns with the, the Transportation Trust Fund. Um, but this does note that uh, we do have a, a millage subsidy that you've approved. That'll total $12 million uh, in the current fiscal year. 
And, you know, without that, you know, we would be operating in a deficit and looking for other funding sources for the operating. Um, and also just to note that our operating costs um, do increase about 3% annually, and that's a combination of new assets that are constructed and installed and just the, the rising cost of, to maintain the existing assets that we have. I uh, just want to give a brief... Um, I'm sorry, just a quick question going back to that one slide. That, that is the... Um, that point one two seven nine is the amount of millage that it takes to get the money that we agreed to f subsidize the fund. We don't actually have a designated millage anywhere as far as in our policies. No, that was we've we've done that by um, direction from the commission. Right. And so we've said you you specifically said this amount last year that su that supported and sustained that fund, which primarily went to sidewalks. And so, but it's not a, it's, it, right. it's not a designated amount. Right. I just want to make sure that we are phrasing things so that it's not in, you know, perpetual motion that 0.1279 mills is always a subsidy to that transportation trust fund. Even though I understand that's what Yeah, we, we'll bring it, well, I mean, it's actually a good question of kind of how the commissioners want to phrase that during the budget process. My intent was to bring it back as part of the millage and say, here's the amount for this purpose and just call it out as part of the budget um, you know, um, process. But it's a policy decision each year in terms of where you, where you choose to fund that. Right, and it, it, the commission, depending on other issues, the commission may want to say, well, we only want to do 11 million this year, or we may want to do 13 million. So anyway, I just, yes. things have a way of getting embedded in mm -hmm. uh, our conversations year after year. To that point, Barry, that Commissioner Justice just raised, I mean, I have never been a proponent of taking millage rates and moving them backwards because of the way in which our tax system works in this state. It's very regressive, as you know. And when the economy is booming and everything is clicking along, it's not a bad idea, except you set yourself up for some pretty tough decisions going forward when all of a sudden it takes a big dive because that money's not really there anymore. And I think it's, um, I think it's very, very disingenuous to call these things that we do tax increases because that is the fault of the way our tax system operates in this state. And as you know, the county commission doesn't really have any authority to deal with that. It's all done at the state legislative level. And I think that's important to stress because we all know how difficult messaging has become in order to be able to explain this very complicated issue to the average citizen most people don't really understand how our tax system works. And even when you, even when you serve on the, um, the, 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 uh, the committees in Tallahassee that deal with this issue, it gets even more complicated. So I, as Commissioner Justice said, I think we have to be very careful how we approach that millage issue going forward. I know that on forward Pinellas, that's something that we did several years ago, not exactly the same thing, but now we're hard pressed and the dollars aren't there. And that's a problem. Well, that's, that'll be part of the budget discussion this year. Um, as you know, you're well aware we did a rollback rate, um, but, but from a public standpoint, I, there was no other local government jurisdiction. They kept the rate the same. Or um, raised it. And, and or raised it and we, and we did a rollback rate. Um, we did a rollback rate in full except for the additional money for infrastructure, which was for our sidewalks. Um, and so we netted out no new money except for sidewalks. Um, but that's hard to understand. You know, it's hard to message um, because I didn't see any other articles, you know, for local for other local governments because they kept the rate the same. It gets it gets complicated, but but that's the reason for today's discussion because I, I want to understand from the commission um, whether it's on property tax or whether it's on fees like we talked about or on other things. What is it? What's the level of service you want us to accomplish? 
based upon that type of discussion, we can bring back options you know, um, to you as part of the budget process. So this is just the beginning of those discussions. It is, but Mr. Chair, may I have a follow-up, yes, please? To your point, I think it's really important that we recognize that what we did last year, much to my chagrin, I have to say, is we raised the level of expectation in the eyes of our public. And now um, I worry that they will anticipate and or expect that we will do that again. It doesn't feel good to say that, but that's my fear. And I want to just put it Wouldn't out there it. for consideration as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Well, I think as you view the, um, the upcoming presentation <laughs> by Tom, you'll see that we're going to need this designated millage to continue because of the, and if you think back to our citizen surveys, every year that I've been a county commissioner, that we've done the survey, transportation yeah. has been, infrastructure has been the number one issue forever. And so I really felt like this was a wise decision that we did to try to modernize and keep our infrastructure um, available and in good shape for our citizens and to improve it. So um, I um, believe that this was a wise movement and that we should continue that. If I can make one final comment, and then we, we do need to let Tom, you know, get to his presentation. But I think that's incumbent upon us to do a better job of communicating with the public, you know? Because if you look at people that have put referendums on, if you put it on for infrastructure, they pass. You put it on under general government, they fail. Why? It's trust in government, okay? And what we did was what, what the public would accept, which is 100% infrastructure. It's to maintain that level of service. We didn't do it to increase salaries. We didn't do it to increase general government. And so that's a come upon us as you make some of these decisions to do a better job of, of reaching out and explaining that and making sure people are clear on where that money is going. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, doing a better job of communicating with our residents. Um, and obviously that includes trying to engage them and they're certainly more engaged today than they were two or three years ago. So. <laughs> Um, and as it relates to our infrastructure, you know, I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversation coming up. The, um, when we go back in 2026 or whenever that is for the next penny, I think we're going to have to face the fact that a higher percentage of our $90 million estimate that we're getting now a year for the county has to go for infrastructure, basic infrastructure. And that's what we're going to have to tell our residents, because when you hear some of the story that we're about to hear, there's, it's not going to happen overnight. And if we don't spend the money on the roads that we have that are considered adequate or good, first, and piecemeal those bad roads a little bit at a time, we're going to end up having to spend every dollar on bad roads. So we're going to have to keep those good roads going that are just B rated or C rated or whatever the, the, the rating system is, um, at the same time have a separate approach to the roads that are in just terrible condition. Because if we attack those first, then all those other good roads are gonna end up in that same condition by the time we get to it. So it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a challenge, but I think a bigger piece of that 90 million a year that we get for, it's gonna have to go candidly. Now we didn't say that when we tried to get this penny passed. There was other issues in that that, that, that we're trying to address. And I'm not saying they don't need to be addressed, but the infrastructure is where we really need to be doing a better job, I think. Um, let, so. let us get through this presentation, and but I will, I mean, some of the, I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because we could really get into this conversation, um, but some of the misinformation that's been, you know, put out regarding where the penny has gone of, of speakers that have come before this commission, I will tell you, you know, um, it's just incorrect, you know, um, and and I'm going to set the record straight on that. You know, the, you know, we have like for instance on affordable housing, we have spent money out of penny three on affordable housing. It was part of the plan there, and it was clearly part of this plan when we passed it in the documents that were submitted. Um, and in fact, 1.3 percent or 1.7 percent of the money over penny three and penny four went to affordable housing. So it's a very small amount. Most of it, the vast vast majority of that money went for infrastructure, 
you know, it went for infrastructure. And again, that, that's on us, that's on staff. We need to do a better job communicating that. And we're gonna do that because I want the public to know that the money went for the purpose of which they voted for. Um, and so, um, you know, that, maybe that was a wake up for us, um, but we're gonna come out with some documents that are, that's gonna make that crystal clear. I because think, it has went for uh, things that the, the public voted for. Yeah. But I think part of the problem, Barry, was when we, when we did this, it was 2017. Yes. It was not a countywide election, uh, if you will, for this. And, and so I think the engagement back then wasn't as high either. So okay. I think that, that's part of it. So yeah. I think better messaging. It's clear that we had a separate number for affordable housing. Clear we had a separate number for courts. And it, that's not an issue. Yeah. But I think there has to be... You know, yeah. that, that I, I agree. Thing. I don't so, want to be defensive in this. Yeah. I really yeah, want. Exactly. I want to. I want to do it as I want the public to have trust that we did exactly what we said, right. and um, and I think that we can do a better job with that, and we intend to. Having had conversations this week with several residents on this issue, uh, I think you're absolutely right. So, yeah. <laughs> can I go there? <laughs> yeah, I think we should. Okay. Before, before I say something. <laughs> yeah, we, that's why I said I, I hated to say that, but since it was brought up, I really wanted to at least put some actual data out. But Tom, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to give you a brief update. This is the sidewalk uh, program. Um, so last year and the work that we did leading up to the, uh, the increased amount of funding that you authorized, um, you know, just as a recap, we had a backlog that totaled almost two years to get out there and repair sidewalk, existing sidewalk that was damaged. Um, we were adding sidewalk each year um, and we weren't keeping up with, with the level of, of maintenance that was required. Um, with the increased dollars that you authorized last year, um, we really feel like we've developed a program and, and moving forward, this is what a a, a model program could look like in, in terms of sustainability for any of our infrastructure uh, moving forward. But uh, the goal is to reduce the backlog um, 100%, eliminate that within two years. Um, we've been aggressive with the funding over the last three or four months. Um, we've actually reduced the backlog by about 48%. So we're well on our way to meeting that goal of two years. Once we've accomplished that, the funding that's in place that allowed us to increase the personnel that we have specific to sidewalk maintenance um, will guarantee that the backlog um, does not get in that situation, that we will not have a backlog moving forward. And you know, we're looking forward to uh, fiscal year 25 uh, to be able to report back to you that we've accomplished that uh, with the sidewalk program. Just before we move into the specifics on the pavement, wanted to give an overview of our capital program uh, for transportation specifically. Um, in the CIP, we currently have $624 million in, in improvements that will extend out through fiscal year 29. Um, we have updated that estimate recently. Uh, it's an increase of $86 million, about 13%, uh, which accounts for completing the engineering reports, refining the scopes, actually identifying what the improvements need to be. And it's also reflective of the increased costs that we're seeing uh, across the board for construction. Um, and then there was $5 million for two penny promised projects that weren't included in the budget that you'll see in fiscal year 23. Those are two intersection projects. One was Bay Pines and 95th Street, and the other one is the, the Keystone Fire Station up in the north part of the county. Um, in addition to what's currently in the, in the program, we also have uh, almost $27 million in ARPA funding that we just got authorized and we're working towards the projects. Um, that is a lot of new infrastructure specific to sidewalk. There's a lot of new sidewalk segments, uh, again, completing those gaps. Um, we do have a couple projects that we don't have all the budget lined up for, the East Lake Road study that you're well aware of. We've got funding in the, in the budget for the design and the, and the study. Uh, we don't have the, the budget lined up for the construction dollars yet, and that's looking to be about $35 million is what we're seeing right now. And then obviously you're well aware of the Dunedin Causeway. We've got about half of that funding lined up currently in the budget, and, and we're actively seeking federal funds and, and monitoring and working with Ford Pinellas and our partners to, to identify uh, potential funding sources so that we're ready to, to move forward with construction when design is complete there. Um, in addition to all that, we do have about $116 million in projects that are on the the wants list that are currently unfunded. Um, 
Some of that uh, is the overpasses and, and some of those considerations with the trail crossings that, that you have asked us to look at. So we have been working with Ford Pinellas to get those on the, uh, the funding list so that when the opportunities come up, we can apply for grants and, and hopefully move some of those forward a little bit faster than what we're anticipating. So. Um, yes, Tom, um, I had previously been contacted by um, some folks in the East Lake area, and I thought that there wasn't anything that was being suggested, but today you're saying, well, we're talking about a possible $35 million project. Well, are you talking about adding lanes, or what are you, I mean, what is the, um, when I queried about the question, it was like, well, we're still looking at it, we really don't know. Yeah, this is the uh, the East Lake Road study that goes essentially from Curlew, Curlew. Road all the way up to the, the Pasco County line. So we have received the data collection from the consultant. They've made some initial recommendations. Um, there is, obviously we have to take it back to the public to see what the consideration would be for an additional lane in each direction. Um, you know, that that's there's a policy constraint uh, to overcome there. Um, the consultant's aware of that, and so what they're really looking at are some intersection improvements, some pretty significant intersection improvements at the... Uh, What's the timeline to come back with a preferred alternate? I believe we are, are looking to take it to the public this summer, as, as far as the schedule goes, um, with our initial findings and, and, and to gather feedback. Um, well, please make sure that we see it before yeah, it goes sure. to the public. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't have put out the $35 million because then that gets to the preferred alternate, so I'm sure CNCN is going to be calling right after this, um, wanting an update on where this is. Because as part of that study, this is the, always the, pro the issue with um, the 10-year capital plan with the penny. Mm -hmm. So here you have a major investment corridor that, that we know something needs to be done, but you don't know whether you're going to expand intersections or whether you're going to add lanes. And you have to go through this planning process um, before, so we can't budget for X amount of dollars because we don't know which alternate they're going to do. And so, so we know you've got an amount of money coming that we're going to need to prioritize within the capital plan, but we can't, but we can't put it in because we haven't gone through the preliminary engineering. And so those are the, that's kind of the, the difficulty with the penny, the way it's set up. And, and that's the reason you don't see defined projects in the out years until some of the planning for these projects uh, goes through that process. Sorry, one more thing on that. You know, years ago we looked at putting, thinking about using the median in East Lake Road and doing reverse lanes. So, and you know, in the morning going probably south and in the evening going north. And then the other thing I just, um, I know I've talked to Witt about it before, but and I've talked to staff, but I want to reemphasize the fact that once the Roosevelt connector is built, we are going, we already have a problem at Drew Street and um, McMullen Booth Road. We better get ready and address that now because that is going to be a major issue. That and, and, you're, and you're going to have issues at Route 62. Yes, we will. So we really need to make sure we've got a plan for that. Yeah, and, and I, that's great points. I think the reverse lane has been talked a lot about, and, and this is a curlew to the county line project. Um, and I, I think I would had some conversation with you that the, the improvements that we're looking at on 19 or not looking at, whatever is going on over there is going to have impact on, on East Lake. So we don't want to do things. And, and again, I think we can, you can widen the roads, but if you don't deal with the junctions, the, 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 the intersections, curlew, all the way down, it just becomes a different problem. You're just moving it in, in directions. So, so I think the reverse lane, I think the idea that, uh, and I, some people have talked about the safety issues and you know, how, do we, how do we cover during the rush hour traffic Back up, backing up the, the East Lake firehouses. And I think there's ways to do it without roads. So I'm hoping that this study is, is inclusive of these other ancillary roads that have an effect on what we're, we're talking about here. So, and if not, maybe we need to make sure that we're, we, at least we understand that. We're trying to get the state to allow dollars to be used in different directions from the main road. Um, to help move traffic. So we, I just think we need to be looking at all of that. Um, but anyway, thank you.
Okay, now we'll transition into uh, the uh, the pavement discussion, which which I think is what everybody's most interested in. Um, just before, uh, as we get into this, just an overview of the of the road assets. Um, we break our, our road classifications up into arterials, collectors, and local roads. Um, the local road network makes up about 50% of, of our overall road network, um, and that's all with all the local roads are within the unincorporated uh, portions of the county. The, the arterials and collectors, there are significant portions of those that actually run through municipal uh, boundaries. So as we get into how we assess our, our pavement, uh, we Every three years, we conduct a pavement condition assessment uh, where we go out and look at every roadway, every roadway segment. Uh, we follow an ASTM uh, national standard. It's a best practice to um, basically determine what condition the pavement is in. We take that information. We've, we've got a database that it all goes into um, that helps us to prioritize the, the program itself. Um, but well, we take those seven classifications out of the ASTM and we, we convert it like we do all of our assets into a level of service uh, criteria. So we've got ranges there for what we consider to be very good all the way down to failed in, in terms of what that PCI rating is on a particular roadway segment. And then from there, uh, we update that database every three years comprehensively, but we also update the database specifically with roads as we pave them and, and update the PCI numbers in the database for that. This is just an overall uh, review of where we're currently at, current state of the county's network. Um, the takeaway here is that almost 55% of, of the roads are in either a poor or failed condition. Um, and those pictures on the right kind of describe what some of the, the conditions and you're familiar with them, the potholes and, and the rutting and the alligator cracking, um, but those are all different levels of distress that get looked at and, and rated that go into this the pavement condition index rating. Yeah, it's, yes. it's in the presentation. The, yes, they're going to they're going to go through the different types of roads, and you can see kind of where they prioritize their money, whether it's you know local roads or whether it's arterials and things like that. And that's coming up right here. So what we've done with that that previous slide is we've broken it broken it down into the arterials, collectors, and locals, um, and you can see the the PCI ratings for each of the different classifications. Um, the strategy over the past couple of years with the funding that we've had is to put the paving money in primarily into arterials and collectors and keep them in a good condition. Uh, so you can see that the arterials in particular, uh, most of that um, is, is above the fair range. Um, there is a small percentage that's in the failed. But when you look at the, the right column there at the locals, you can see that there's a, a large part of the network that's either in the poor or failed condition. So that's kind of been the strategy, like I said, over the past couple of years with the funding that we've had. This is just another graphical representation. Um, puts three pieces of information on one slide for you. So you can see the arterial collector locals and then the network as a whole. So that, that top one is the overall PCI. So again, graphically, you can see the arterials are in pretty good shape. Uh, the collectors aren't too far behind, but the locals are, are what's suffering. The annual rate of, of the decline averages about 3% per year for PCI rating. That's what that middle, uh, the orange boxes show. And then the bottom boxes kind of show for each of the, the different roadway types um, how often we should be planning to resurface that to, to make sure they don't get into a condition where we're looking at some more significant repair or rehabilitation costs. This is a typical pavement deterioration curve. Uh, you've seen this before, we've, we've presented it. Um, and really what this shows is that once we build a road or repave a road and we get it up to a high PCI, it does hold up pretty well for about the first 10 or 12 years. You know, it's very slight over the course of time where it starts to degrade. Um, and any time that we resurface a road or build a road, we are, as a county, aggressive at protecting that pavement. Uh, we work closely with our uh, DRS staff and permitting so we don't allow open cuts. If there's utility damage, uh, there are significant rehabilitation uh, costs. So it's not simply just repairing what the, uh, what the damage was done, but we, we require significant repair um, 
limits on that type of roadway. But once you get beyond that 15 year mark, um, it really does start to drop off. And, and I know Barry's made the point that, you know, before you get into that vertical part of the curve, that's where we need to be spending the money. Um, otherwise, the repairs and the rehabilitation become much more expensive. And then we have to start strategizing, you know, do we actually do anything to that road or do we continue to let it degrade? Do we, um, when we talk about the condition assessment that you, you said you'd, we do every few years and go out, I assume that we're pumping that into our um, asset, uh, I forget what we call it. Uh, city Works. It's the database that we have is payer, but that feeds into our City Works okay. asset management program. So it's the asset, yeah, the asset management you spend a lot of money on. Yes, it's part of that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the point here, and I think for the public is, you know, the, I mean, obviously from the public standpoint, they want to drive on a decent road and not hit potholes and everything else. But from a cost effectiveness standpoint, if if you let a road go to a certain point, you can't just go in and re and, and put, you know, blacktop over it. You've got to you've got to do the under drains. You've got to do the base. And so reconstructing a road is what, how, many, how many more times it's more expensive than to repave? Almost six times. Yeah, Easily I mean, it, six times. it doesn't make good financial sense. Um, but unfortunately, right now, because we only have, they're putting their money on the major roads because they don't have enough, we, we then have to do this because the road gets to a certain point. So if, if you get ahead of that to where you never, ever have to reconstruct roads, it's actually much more cost effective. It's going to be the gap to get you there, just like the sidewalk. It's that backlog to get us there. Once we get there... We probably, you know, are close to having that type, the, the money to maintain it, but we've got a significant backlog because we haven't had sufficient funds to be able to maintain our roads and at the right and and repave at the right point at that 75% of life versus it deteriorating to a point where you have to spend a lot more money to bring it back to a good condition. I do have a local example that, that we're getting ready to repave to, to share with you. This is on Drew Street. If you're familiar with Drew Street, this is a segment from US 19 West to, to Coachman where the state takes over. Um, if you've been out there, you'll, you know that the pavement has a lot of um, you know, patches and repairs that have been done, but you'll also see that we've, so far, we've repaired all of the sidewalk along that segment. We've replaced all the drainage structures. Uh, so we've done the prep work. We are getting ready to mill and resurface uh, this particular road has a PCI rating of about 24, so it's very low, close to the failed condition. Um, and you can see there in fiscal year 23 where we're getting ready to pave. You know, typically we're paving one and a half inches to two inches for this because it's in, in a pretty poor state. So we're actually going a little bit deeper with the millinery surface, so two to three inches. Uh, the cost at about $650,000. But the graphic shows that once we pave it, the PCI goes way up. You get that standard over the next several years, that steady decline of about 3% per year. Our maintenance costs go to just about zero, especially for the first couple years, very minimal. And if we've got a program in place and when we're able to plan for this um, in about the 2036 timeframe and start doing the prep work and getting set up for paving, um, you'll see on the right side, you know, that we are back to one and a half to two inches of millinery surface at a cost um, just a little bit higher than what it's going to cost us today. So that's, that's pretty significant when we're looking 15 years out that, that we're going to be able to do the same work if we're smart about it for about the same cost that it's going to cost us today. So getting into where we're at funding-wise, um, we've got several scenarios, and I'm, I'm just about through the presentation and opening up for uh, questions here. Uh, this is our current state. So we, our paving program is budgeted at $17 million per year. Remaining uh, charts in here are all about the same. So.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're going to reconvene our meeting. Uh, we're going to get back on item number two, our transportation update. Uh, uh, before we begin that, I do want to make note, uh, Commissioner Peters is not in attendance today. She's attending to some family business and uh, wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Uh, Mr. Washburn, come on up. And we're going to go back a couple of slides from where we were in our previous meeting so that we can have a discussion uh, on the record. Um, the slides aren't numbered, so can you tell us? He'll where? he'll bring it up. Okay, uh, Mr. Burton. Anything before we jump in? No, um, we're, we're you're going to see the slide. This basically we're going to start where we talk about the existing budget, and um, that way we can create a record, a board record. That's when the audio cut out, and so this will. We're just going to briefly recap it, just so we can have um, a, a uh, official record. Very good. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. So stepping back. Make sure the presentation is up before I get started. We can yeah. see it. We, we see it. It's up. We see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've stepped back to the, the top of the slide says current budget status quo scenario. Um, and just to recap the way these um, scenarios are laid out across the top, uh, the, the big number in the top right is the annual budget currently that we have for the paving program. That's the $17 million per year. Uh, we've broken that out into our million and resurfacing costs, our preparation costs, and our administrative costs. So those three sums together is, is what comprises the, the paving program. Current state, we're currently at a, for the network, we're at a current state of a PCI of, of 49, so just about 50. Uh, we've got it broken down on the charts by arterial collector and local. So you can see the arterial network is in pretty good shape, um, just above 60. Uh, the collector uh, PCI is at 56, and then the local is, is what's low at, at 39. Uh, the current state at $17 million per year, what we're showing here is that we will continue to lose ground with the paving program and, and the quality of the paving that we have um, at about 3% per year. So then what we've got for the next several slides are various scenarios, the modeling that we've done to look at different PCIs for the different types of road, uh, the arterials, collectors, and locals, and really just to, for the conversation purposes, again, as we move into the budget session, um, various scenarios. Really what has changed is the, uh, the scenario PCI and then the number of years that we put into the model to get to that network PCI. So this first one um, is a scenario that says if we take the whole network up to a PCI of 60, um, so we're there with the collector, we've got some work to do with, or I'm sorry, we're there with the arterials, we've got some work to do with the collectors and locals, but at an additional annual cost of just under $31 million, um, that would get us to a network <coughs> PCI of 60 in six years. So this is, again, just one scenario. Um, we also looked at a scenario where we said, let's keep the arterials and collectors at that high level, uh, the PCI 60, but still improve the locals, but let's bring those up to a PCI of 50, and the cost for that would be an additional $27 million per year uh, to allow us to accomplish that, and that would allow us to accomplish that in nine years. And then the last scenario that we've got is... Um, Let's keep the arterials at the high level. Let's maintain those where we've got them. We take a lot of work to get there, um, so we're there. Let's keep the collectors and the, and the locals at a PCI of 50, and that cost uh, comes in at, at $24.5 million additional per year uh, for that program. That gets also gets us there in nine years. <coughs> and then this last one is the status quo, I believe. Me... Yes. So this is the last slide. This, this slide we put together to say, okay, let's keep the network where we're currently at today. So the arterials, uh, the collectors, and the locals, um, let's improve them to an overall PCI of 50, and let's be able to sustain that um, starting with the next fiscal year. And so just to get us, uh, so that we don't lose ground with the paving program, that's an additional $12.7 million. Um, wouldn't this bring the locals up though higher because you're currently at 39 on, on locals so it would improve the locals up to a scenario of 50 which is level service C that's correct Un under this scenario you're correct this would bring the locals up to a PCI 50 it would allow the arterials and collectors to drop off over time um, to the to the PCI 50 um, 
So, uh, you know, and that's really it. The, the, the issue is, you know, it's, it's about, we wanted to give you kind of just a snapshot. And this is a lot of information to take in, but this gives you kind of an idea on the scale of, um, of the type of funding that would be needed, uh, dependent upon, you know, where we go with this um, in terms of um, bringing up the maintaining our roads at a higher level of standard that we're at today. But the big thing is, again, getting to a level of service where we're able to repave and not reconstruct and, and have a more cost-effective program. Um, and we're going we're gonna to have to even, as, and as we talk about some of the funding scenarios, we have to think about that because if we're talking about local roads, uh, we could do it through fees and things like that, but you could do that through a MSTU on, for the unincorporated because local roads are unincorporated. The arterials are a little different because they go right through municipalities. And so then we have to look at countywide type funding strategies. So that's the reason it gets, you know, pretty complicated. Um, but w again, we'll, we'll get into different scenarios and funding, um, but w wanted to just give you kind of a baseline of information. Uh, it's the first time we've really had this type of analysis on our roads. Um, and sometimes, so um, Tom's here. He can answer any um, questions, any follow-up you want us to look at. Commissioner Flowers. Um, just a question. Um, do we have any examples of any of our arterial or collector roads being shared roads with FDOT? No, FDOT is our own jurisdiction, um, so they maintain all of their roads where we have our locals, um, you know, great examples would be like um, County Road 611, McMillan Booth Road. Right. Uh, that runs through several municipalities. Um, but you do have roads where, take Drew Street. Part of Drew Street is Clearwater, part of it is a county, part of it is a state. But it's different sections of that road that unless you knew that, you would never know <laughs> as you drive that, along. That's why I was asking if there was some shared use that maybe we could look at them for share funding um, when it comes to um, maintaining them. But as you've just stated, that's why it's a question I wasn't sure. Thank you. Commissioner? Just so when we have a situation like that, we each maintain our own section. So we yep, may have we a have piece to. that's really good and they have a piece that's really bad. And I'll, I'll let Tom answer that because I'm sure it's a hodgepodge. It happens all the time. <laughs> I'm sure it's a hodgepodge, and we have inter uh, local agreements for maintenance and things like that, depending <laughs> upon the section of road. But Tom, yeah, and, and that's correct. When we've got those situations where we go from mm -hmm. clearly a state maintained to a county maintained, um, when you're out there, if you look at it on on an aerial, you can see where the scene is. Where one agency may have uh, resurfaced at one point, and that was the cutoff point for. No. But that's also the reason you see some of these road transfer agreements. Right. Um, and so they have an effort to try and as they upgrade a road, then turn it over to where point A to point B is all one jurisdiction. So they're doing that, but it's a slow process. So it's it's additional $12 million a year just to maintain Pain. where we are today. Correct. So if we don't increase the funding by $12 million, we're going to fall to a, a lower level of service on these roads? Correct. Well, that's what a little clarification. You would, you would actually improve your locals. By $12 million a year, you would, it, you would slightly improve your locals to a level C. Um, we're currently at a, what, an F right on our enough. locals. It's at 39%. It would bring it to 50 So you would slightly increase your level of maintenance for your local roads, and the others would pretty much be status quo. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, that's so accurate under that again. scenario. And again, you know, yeah. we can run various scenarios if, if the desire was to keep the RTLs and collectors where they are and, and see what we could do to bring the, the locals up to an acceptable level. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, you, you go back, you brought up the Drew Street example. Yes, sir. Um, and I was just, you know, driven that a lot. And it, it didn't strike me as a road especially east of McMullen Booth that was mm -hmm. as bad as you said it was. What, would, what did you rate? Um, uh, what was the ro road rate? size about a 24. Right 24. Yeah. Wow. Is that, that, that's an average uh, over that, or is it, is it different east and west of uh, Belcher? No, it's an average over the entire segment. Okay, so um, the roadway, I mean, it's, the roadway to the west does seem a little uh, like a more degradation, I guess, than the, the eastern, but... Um, 
I'm just trying to get some, you know, some examples of the road condition. So if you tell me west of is in, is like 20 and east of is 40, um, you know, and we're and we're and that's our goal, and we're not talking about structural degradation. We're just talking about maybe increasing the the width of the pave paving, right, from one inch to three inches or whatever you said. Okay. I mean, that's important. Those are little details, but it'd be nice to know. Um, okay. What those roads? Yeah, and we, yeah. we've got the PCIs where we can break them down by you know specific segments, and, and we can. Well, just use. just to give us a sense because that, that's a collector, right? That is a collector. Uh, that, so that is a collector. It's not a local road. Um, and then our give give some examples of of arterials, collectors, and local. Sure. So um, Drew Street's a, a good example of a collector. Um, Arterials that we have would be um, East Lake Road, County Road 611, McMullen Booth, 49th Street, um, Starkey Road, uh, Keystone Road. Um, sure. You know that whole that whole segment of, of Keystone would be considered an arterial. What's that? Ad? What's that rating? Keystone was beautiful. Uh, that's still in, in really good shape. That was constructed. I think it's we reconstructed that back in yeah. 05, 06 mm -hmm. when we completed it. That if you if you look back several slides, you'll see that the the collectors, I mean, or the arterials, especially, you keep those in pretty good shape. That's where you put your priority of funding. Yeah, that's that's been the strategy. Um, we have one segment. If you look at, and I can flip back if you'd like, but the uh, this chart here, that 4.78 miles on the arterial that's in a a failed condition. Um, that's one of a one mile segment of Trinity Boulevard up in the north part of the county. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got it's a four lane divided, so one mile that says four lane miles, and that represents the bulk of that. Okay. So. okay. So that gives you a little background. If we can, um, the next piece we'll bring up is Wit, and he's going to talk about kind of a, a bigger picture, <clears throat> and then we'll come back and then kind of brainstorm. Kind of um, thoughts in terms of where you want to go with, the, with some of this. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Mr. Blanton, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. Commissioners. It's strange being back in this room. I feel really <laughs> close to you all right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, what I would like to do is set a little context and provide a little framing on our countywide transportation needs and planning activities. And uh, just a reminder for folks who may not know who we are, Ford Pinellas is the countywide land use and transportation planning agency. Uh, we serve as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which means we are the conduit for federal and state funds uh, into Pinellas County for transportation projects. And our goal is really to look first at our countywide land use needs and make sure that we then uh, prioritize transportation needs and projects that support how we're growing, where we're guiding growth and redevelopment. Uh, and we're doing that on behalf of all 25 local governments in Pinellas County. So it's really important uh, that you know, we think of the different situations and contexts throughout Pinellas County. And that all does take really strong partnerships. And Pinellas County is one of our major partners because you have so many roads that you maintain and there's uh, so much of the county that, that's under Pinellas County Authority. But we also have the Florida Department of Transportation, 24 cities, the Pinellas Suncoast Transportation Authority. And then for regional needs, we are partners through the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance with the other MPOs in the region to prioritize regional transportation projects for the Florida Department of Transportation. But I want to step back just a little bit and talk about what everybody has kind of had on their minds when, when in transportation for uh, a few months, which is the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed by Congress and signed into law by the president last year. Uh, it does provide significant amounts of dollars uh, in transportation funding over a five-year period, uh, not just transportation, energy, broadband, uh, water, and utilities and communications are all part of that. Uh, but we're really looking at the transportation piece, and it's our job to bring as much of that authorized revenue to Pinellas County for the benefit of our citizens and our needs, and, and frankly, to the benefit of Tampa Bay as well. The infrastructure law is broken into two areas. There's uh, formula programs, which come to us sort of as right, based on the fact that we have an MPO, we have a certain population threshold, and then there's competitive funding. And most of the new funding uh, in this bipartisan infrastructure law is competitive. 
Uh, and that really puts pressure on all of us to make sure we're aligned in our priorities, we're working together, and we're um, setting priorities uh, collaboratively so that we know what we're going after because we're going to be competing with the Miamis and the Fort Lauderdales and the Chicagos and the Atlantas and the Charlottes. Um, one of the things that's really important for not just the competitive, some of the formula programs, but certainly the competitive programs, is that local match uh, is essential. And that might be 20%, it might be as much as 50%, uh, and then the commitment to maintain and operate what you get. Uh, typically, that's a 20-year commitment. So if that funding comes in, you're required to commit to that maintenance. There are a number of funding opportunities. I can't possibly put all of these on one slide. This would be a long presentation. Uh, but you can just see here that they cover the gamut from resiliency to congestion relief to safe streets uh, to uh, ferry boats and facilities. Uh, and then I also wanted to pair this with how the state of Florida is pivoting a little bit because uh, the state of Florida is also looking at increased funding flexibility, which is something we've advocated for. Uh, we, we don't appreciate a one-size-fits-all approach in our communities, uh, and so we've been advocating that FDOT introduce more flexibility because we've had to um, really take a pass on some funding that comes to us because it's tethered on increasing capacity. And we only have a few places in our county where we can really add capacity. Um, and so we're not taking full advantage of some of the state funding programs without that flexibility. So these three areas are areas in which the state is beginning to introduce some flexibility. The strategic intermodal system might allow funds, for instance, uh, to go on parallel roads to US-19 uh, or other parts of the strategic intermodal system. The district dedicated revenue program would allow for state funds to go towards transit operations uh, over a five-year period, uh, maybe starting at 100% in year one, down to maybe 0% after year five, and then it's up to the locals. But that's all local decision-making, whereas now, if you want to apply for any operating assistance for transit, it's all decided in Tallahassee, and it's all statewide. So we're really competing at a different level than if it was determined by our local district. And the service development grants is a pilot program. They're looking at modifying what's already being done to better link workforce housing <coughs> Uh, affordable housing and jobs and job training, which is coincidentally perfect with what we've been planning for about the last two or three years. I wanted to just take a step back also and let you know that we do have some major transportation projects that are under construction or about to be under construction uh, and, and nearing completion, and all of these were done with partnerships of federal and state funds in some cases, uh, local money in some cases. The Gateway Expressway is a really good example where we use transportation regional incentive program dollars uh, that we get region, through our regional partnership. Penny for Pinellas money went into that, mm -hmm. and it's part of the strategic intermodal system. So that's kind of how we have to do things. Um, we have the Howard Franklin Bridge under construction now. The West Shore Interchange will be under construction starting in 23. It will be under construction for six years. So <laughs> if we don't develop some alternatives, uh, the maintenance of traffic is going to be a nightmare. Uh, so US plan your flights accordingly. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, US 19 is uh, starting um, construction this year, probably later this fall, and that'll be about a three-year period from Main Street to Curlew Road with an interchange at Curlew. Um, the North Gap of the Pinellas Trail that, that the county is completing, that's with a uh, partnership with the state of Florida. Uh, and then the Sunrunner, our bus rapid transit major capital investment is opening this fall, and we're really excited to see that project in St. Petersburg. So our vision for uh, how we grow and guide uh, development and transportation in Pinellas County is really centered on that piece of community, environment, and opportunity, and we really want to preserve and protect those areas that need that, uh, whether it be established neighborhoods or our industrial and employment lands or our coastal high hazard area. Uh, and then we have a three-legged stool of how we really focus on transportation to support that, improving traffic flow and congestion, uh, creating uh, our trail networks and safer streets, and then enhancing transit services. And I, I put this in here, we are projecting about 100,000 people moving into Pinellas County by 2045. And if the last three years since we developed that projection or any indication, we've estimated too low. Mm -hmm. um, we've been growing at a faster rate than we were uh, historically. And that's the city of Clearwater. Where do we fit a new city of Clearwater in Pinellas County? Mm -hmm. So we really have to be mindful about looking at those areas where we can support growth and higher density development in the right locations. We do all that through our countywide plan. 
and the countywide plan is done in collaboration with all 25 local governments to coordinate land use and transportation. And we focused on this Advantage Pinellas framework of looking at investment corridors, some of our commercial corridors, such as US 19, such as Alternate 19 and, and East Bay or Roosevelt, as places where that growth could occur, and to guide it in a way that it, it doesn't um, generate uh, tons and tons of traffic because it's put together in a way that enables people to use transit as an alternative, to walk, to bicycle, uh, and to make shorter trips to their destinations. And that's one of our advantages in this county. As a highly developed county, people don't have to travel too far to get to a grocery store or most of their destinations. And something like 60% of all trips are one to three miles. So we're really set up for that. Um, so our focus has been creating the, the activity centers and the multimodal corridors and enabling the higher density that local governments can take advantage of. We're not forcing it. It's up to the cities. It's up to the county to take advantage of the density that we enable. Uh, and and a, a good example is Largo. We enabled a certain amount of density for their Tri-City Master Plan. In the, alt, in the US 19 Roosevelt area, they took advantage of about half of that density, maybe, maybe even less than half because that was appropriate for that context. So I want to paint a little picture of how we plan and think about the needs in Pinellas County. And you had a discussion about efficiency earlier, and while we may be moving away from just pure automobile efficiency, efficiency is still important in, in my mind and how we plan. And the first piece of that is location efficiency. And I mentioned that we're a compact urban county, so location efficiency is guiding growth to the right locations in the county um, where it can be supported that enables access to destinations for all, uh, and then connecting jobs, homes, and transportation. And we use this little <coughs> framework of 20-minute neighborhoods. Where can you get in a 20-minute travel time to satisfy all or most of your daily transportation needs? And if you can do that by walking, bicycling, or driving, then that's a, that, that helps uh, preserve our infrastructure. The other part of efficiency is modal efficiency, and that's kind of what Tom was talking about in his presentation and that's connected networks like our traffic signal system, intersection improvements, our bike facilities, being connected trails, and mobility hubs. Uh, and then we look at customized solutions for communities and corridors depending on the context. So for um, Belcher Road, for US 19, the context is moving traffic. Uh, but for some of our other roads, it might be complete streets where it's about access and safety for all users. And then seamless intermodal oper oper uh, operability, I can say that, uh, is another part of efficiency, and that is getting from your airport to your hotel quickly and efficiently, walking on foot to the, to the door in front of you, or putting your bike on a bus and getting to your location, or the beach trolley to the water taxi. Efficiency matters for economic opportunity for a number of reasons. Housing and transportation costs are the two biggest budget items for any household in Pinellas County. And most households in Pinellas County are spending about 60% of their household income on those two things. 45% is considered affordable. So there's a lot of data out there about how just a $400 additional expense in a month really sets people back. Mm -hmm. So better transit access to jobs lowers household costs and raises household income. And why is that? Because if you can get to more jobs in a 30 minute or 45 minute travel time, you have a lot more choices, and you can find a better salary, and you can negotiate a better salary, potentially. But if you don't have those options, you're kind of stuck with what's, what's available to you. And it's also important that we think about that regionally, because some of our workers go to Hillsboro, and some of the work people in Hillsboro come to us. And so having better connections across county lines is part of that strategy, particularly with Pasco, where they don't have as many jobs as we do. So our transit vision really starts from a perspective of how our community is laid out. And what's on this map in the highlighted yellow or orange areas are, uh, are communities of concern. These are, are um, environmental justice, lower income, marginalized communities for the most part. Uh, they've been mapped out. And then what you see in the colors on this map are our high injury road network where we kill and injure uh, 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 an inordinate number of of people, not just walkers and bicyclists, but people driving cars as well are part of that. And so we look at how do we connect people from an economic opportunity and sustainability to support livable communities, to get them out of some of these unsafe conditions and provide opportunities for them to get to where they need to go, what, all the while preserving our open space. Yes, sir. Before you go on, the roads that you're saying are highlighted that are 
dangerous intersections. Mm -hmm. um, is that a a one year snapshot? Is that a five year trend? Is that a five year crash data? We looked at that, and it's the top forty percent of our road network. So it's not all of it. If we showed all of it, it would inundate it. But this is really where the concentration of the highest 40% of those crashes are located. Okay. And it's in blue for the corridors, and there are dots that are hard to see where the intersection hotspots are located. Okay, thank you. So that's kind of the backdrop to where we uh, worked with the county uh, administration and others, uh, PSTA, to come up with this investment corridor framework. Uh, and in our 2045 long range plan, we identified these investment corridors where uh, they are the best suited ways to connect housing that's affordable uh, in different parts of the community and where we can build new uh, places that are affordable to jobs and job training and connecting them uh, as best we can with better, faster transit, such as express transit with limited stops, things like that. We went through a process of prioritizing those quarters. We had three priorities in 2019. Uh, we've looked at those quarters uh, based on their redevelopment potential, uh, land use characteristics, and we looked at it on travel patterns as well. And the one that we've chosen to do as a pilot program is Alternate 19, uh, highlighted and dashed here from downtown Clearwater to St. Petersburg, where the Sunrunner is operating in the Central Avenue corridor. And we think that that'll begin to start building more of a countywide network of better transit service throughout the county. Quick, quick question for yes, you, real quick. Um, so we've seen a lot of construction in the last two or three years. Are you are you seeing is it is it going to the areas that you were anticipating or that you were thinking it was going to be going towards? You know those primary corridors. Are you seeing You're most about of, development construction yeah. Uh, yeah. like housing? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is um, particularly in the Pinellas Park and Clearwater area where you see apartments coming up. Uh, in the 49th Street corridor, in the US 19 corridor, and that's because it's close to everything. And um, you know they're seeing the market advantage of having uh, those apartments there. It's getting less and less affordable to build in St. Petersburg. They're still getting a lot of growth, but it's hard to be affordable. So people are moving to Pinellas Park, and they're moving, I'm, I'm talking about developers, and they're moving to Clearwater in the US-19 area. So that's so, yeah. where it's happening. So the thought process behind it that, that you guys have developed is kind of being seen by the private sector as well. It's, they're it's kind of a natural that. fit. Sure. And, yeah. and our cities are great partners. Clearwater adopted a code in, for the US-19 corridor that enabled this development to happen as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> the idea behind these investment corridors uh, is that if you have limited stops for your transit system to allow for faster service, where those stops are located is really important. And we want to make sure that that's where redevelopment opportunities are happening, where we can have nodes, mobility hubs, whatever you want to call them, of higher density development, and where we have good connections for walking, bicycling, and transit in those areas. Uh, and we are doing this Alt-19 study. We're just Next week, we'll authorize the consultant to get started, and we'll have about a year or so to develop that for this quarter, and we'll have a good uh, framework for that. And then we plan to seek uh, state and federal funding for that. Another big component is was alluded to earlier in the, in the morning about the comprehensive plan is Safe Streets Pinellas. Unfortunately, we uh, still uh, have a really rough fatality rate uh, that has spiked in the last year, um, particularly with pedestrians. So we are looking at things like speed management on our roadways, uh, redesign of our roadways, and other features to moderate those travel speeds, particularly in off-peak periods when we've got big, wide roadways, there's not a lot of congestion, and people are just flying down some of these roadways. And thank you, Pinellas County, for adopting the Safe Streets Pinellas Resolution. Another piece of all this is, is waterborne transportation, using our waterways to better connect <coughs> Uh, places where we don't have much parking and we have a lot of traffic congestion, namely Gulf Boulevard, our beaches, uh, Clearwater Beach. And we've had a waterborne committee that has been meeting for about a year, or a little more than a year now, that last week voted uh, to recommend uh, some actions to the Ford Pinellas Board that we'll consider next week. And uh, we see waterborne as a real key economic driver, particularly connecting the mainland to the barrier islands. Uh, it helps visitors and tourists for sure, but it also helps workers get out to the hotels and the restaurants because they can't afford to drive and park and be stuck in congestion either. And we're developing a system plan uh, that has been recommended by the committee uh, and a phased implementation plan that starts 
uh, with a restart of the Clearwater Ferry back to 2019 conditions just to get that service up and, up and running on the regular basis. The recommendation is that be under the administration of the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority so that they could benefit from the ridership uh, reporting that happens, but also to provide more stability and management and structure to how that uh, operates today. It's been privately operated and they've done a great job, but they've also had some deferred maintenance and uh, you know, every one of our uh, services has been sort of an ad hoc, come to you, let's, let's ask for money and let's go about trying to get something started up. And we think a more structured approach would be better at thinking through how we consider waterborne transportation options. So that phase plan would, would consider that. Uh, this has been incorporated into or is, will be incorporated into our Advantage Pinellas Long Range Plan with clear criteria for how we prioritize that service uh, based on a, a lot of different factors including congestion levels and parking and, and economic impact. Uh, the agency could then contract with any of a number of operators to deliver that service. Um, and then we would look at funding feasibility based on initial success and build that through a phased implementation approach. But like everything else, waterborne transportation requires that local match, that local commitment of dollars because the federal uh, government will only pay for capital uh, and the state will typically only pay for capital. So I want to just turn to transportation funding needs about how we connect our jobs uh, and, and housing in Pinellas County. And what I've done is put together a short list of transportation projects that we are pursuing in partnership with some of our local partners in PSTA. But I'm going to focus more on transit because you know, I want to praise Pinellas County for a moment that um, over the last three or four decades, the county has done a really good job building its road network. Uh, advanced traffic management system, the intelligent transportation system to synchronize the traffic signals is state of the art. It's uh, a leader in the state. Um, the roadway network for a compact urban county like ours, you've done a really good job building that out over the last several years. And that's, Penny for Pinellas is a big part of that. The trail network, second to none, anywhere in Florida. And, and we're continuing to build that trail network and add overpasses and things like that. What we really haven't done a good job of is sustaining and supporting our transit system, which is part of that three-legged stool. And so we focus more on the needs here in this because that is really what has lagged for decades. And I've been a consultant on transportation in this county since 1988, uh, working for PSTA, working for the MPO, working for the county, working for cities. And it's the same discussion that we've had since 1988, probably before that. So what you have in front of you is the short-term projects that we've identified. Uh, the waterborne service, uh, that restart plan uh, has been identified at about 1.9 million uh, over a three-year period. Uh, operating is about 1.7 million, and that is Dunedin, Clearwater to Clearwater Beach. Um, you also have made a decision, and I know you're going to be reconsidering that uh, uh, in, in the future, about the Cross Bay Ferry, but that's a component of how you start to build a network of transportation. And then we've got a phased implementation approach for expansion to the south along uh, the Gulf Beaches area too, the Johns Pass Village, Madeira, Treasure Island area, but that's going to be out in phase two. The next thing I want to bring your attention to is a modern uh, Clearwater Transit system. This is the intermodal facility at Park Street. Uh, it was decrepit in 1988 when I was <laughs> doing the operations analysis for PSTA. Uh, it's gotten much worse. The problem with this intermodal center is that it doesn't have capacity for any more service. So North County, anywhere north of Olmerton Road, really can't benefit from more service uh, without this intermodal facility being upgraded. The sewage is backing up. There's a lot of bad problems here. The electric vehicles that PSTA has cannot even use this and cannot access it. So that's another issue. This is about $34 million. And uh, the PSTA has been working with the city of Clearwater on, on a land deal to, to make this happen, but you know, we've been short in getting federal grants for this, um, and so we're going to continue to pursue federal grants in partnership with PSTA for this, but it's, it's a challenge, and the local match will help make that um, a, a, a something that, that can be more achievable with federal funds. On the right-hand side, I'm not going to go into great detail, but I just want to let you know, 34th Street, Bus Rapid Transit. Uh, that project is happening. The state is resurfacing 34th Street through the Skyway Marina District. Mm -hmm. They are adding the business access and transit lanes. Uh, there is more that could be done, but there's already good service there, and there's a lot of growth happening in that corridor. Mm -hmm. I was just down there last night. Uh, PSTA is planning express bus service from downtown St. Pete to the airport, something that people have asked for for many years. 
Uh, we are working on a longer range plan to link the region through that I-275 corridor, uh, but that's going to take a little more time to get Hillsborough County and other partners on board. When and if that happens, great, but in the meantime, we think we still need to connect our airport to our major downtown. And then the Alt-19 quarter investment service, which would be that limited stop frequent bus service, that's a fairly low cost entry into better service, and then we can build from there if it's successful. But I'm a big believer in incremental approaches um, that, lead, that show success and then we build on that success. Longer term, and again, I just want to paint that picture for you a little bit. The second phase of the waterborne system connecting Madeira Beach, places like Indian Rocks, again, where congestion, lack of parking are big issues. Uh, the I-275 Regional Rapid Transit Project I mentioned, we've been working on that for several years uh, through the Tibarda Regional Transit Authority. Um, the state is a big partner in that, but it will take uh, commitment from Pasco, Hillsboro, and Pinellas County to make that a reality. And we're not there yet uh, with political will and consensus. What I'm more optimistic about is the US-19 regional rapid transit between Pasco and Pinellas, because I think there's a little more synergy between Pasco and Pinellas on that corridor, because we have a lot of their workforce coming into our county to work at jobs and then return at night. And that creates congestion problems in our county. So they're eager for transit solutions. We're eager for less congestion and, and, and more options in our county. On the right-hand side, uh, FDOT is currently leading a State Road 580 corridor study through from Dunedin all the way over to Oldsmar. Uh, we see that as a good way to begin connecting transit service into Hillsborough County. There's not really a good interface between Hart and PSTA today, and we have a lot of jobs in the Oldsmar area. Express service from downtown Clearwater to State Road, uh, along State Road 60 to Tampa International. The Clearwater Chamber, Amplify Clearwater, has been really behind this one. Again, uh, giving tourists and visitors and workers an opportunity or an option uh, to travel to our uh, downtown and our beaches. Uh, and then increased frequency for the Jolly Trolley in the north part of the county. Uh, that's an hour frequency up to Tarpon Springs. Getting that to a half hour would make that more of an option. Uh, and then looking at the East Bay uh, Roosevelt Corridor, one of our other priority investment corridors. All these take money. We think they're all going to be candidates for federal and state funding, but that comes with strings and it comes with a commitment. So I'm coming to you today just to kind of get this on your radar screen so that you're aware that uh, at some point as these projects get ready, I'm going to be um, looking for where we can find that local match. As you know, PSTA is at its millage cap. Uh, they do not really have the ability to go find additional local revenues on their own without some help. And, um, and then the cities typically don't have the wherewithal. So what we've tried to focus on are projects that are of countywide significance, um, that benefit the workers, the jobs, and sustain our workforce uh, throughout Pinellas County. So how we achieve this vision? Uh, we've got to continue to work on strengthening our partnerships. I think we have really good partnerships, much better than they were maybe seven or eight years ago. Uh, with the county, with the cities, with PSTA, and with our federal uh, and state partners, and really looking at how that aligns with where growth and redevelopment needs to happen, should happen, and where we want it to happen. Then our job is to identify major priorities for that state and federal funding, and that's going to be a collaborative conversation. But if we're all going after the same grant, and there's three grant applications from Pinellas County, that doesn't send a really good message whether it's for a safety project or for a bridge project or for something else. So we really need to look at what are our one, two, and three priorities in all of these competitive program areas, and that's going to take a lot of conversation over the next year. Uh, and then we need to commit to a complementary funding strategy. If we're going to go after those dollars, we need to be ready to set money aside to be ready when those projects are awarded to show that commitment. So I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Commissioner Seal. Um, just to, and you probably don't know the answer to this, but it, um, I am curious when St. Pete did their intermodal center on uh, Central, where the funding came for that particular project. That was PSTA, you mean on Central Avenue? On right before, I'm sorry. No, you're right. I served on PSTA at the time, <laughs> okay. and I was the one that um, pushed Roger Sweeney to build that there because there um, wasn't a covering or anything. It was just benches, and then there were some issues with persons down in Williams Park, which always occurs. So um, it was PSTA. We um, got those dollars um, pulled together 
to build that intermodal facility. So, but it was all PSTA with no match from St. Petersburg? You didn't get anything from, from St. Pete. Um, and one of the issues um, even now is, and, and you serve on PSTA, persons want the service, other cities want the service, but they don't want to contribute to the cost, <coughs> some cities, mm -hmm. to help provide the service. There but that, seven of them. Yeah, but that that was um, PSTA, and, and um, it took a long time to to get that going. Rick Buck Butler was instrumental, too, in supporting me to um, get our board to move forward um, with that transaction to make that happen. And why I asked was, you know, to have PSTA come to the county for $15 million um, is a little puzzling. We're going <clears> to... <throat> I want to talk about some policy-related okay. issues about where you want to go with this, because... Ultimately, it does come, any of these come down to funding, but there are some policy implications of, of decisions on exactly. where, where, where we're involved or not involved. And, and so we wanted to frame, I didn't want to just talk about our road you know, needs, I wanted to frame it all. And then now we can have a discussion about you know, what do we do. I don't think that we're, we can solve everything, um, but <coughs> these strategies and this feedback is really kind of the, the ending piece that we we'll wanted to occur from today. And what really and then the other, um, and I'm new to PSTA, so I've only been to two meetings. I'm still getting my hands wrapped around some things, but they have a pretty good amount of reserves right now. So I just wanted to add that where the intermodal facility is, that was PSTA property because that used to be a street. It was 32nd mm -hmm. Street that went straight through, mm -hmm. um, and the buses would just pull up. You would sit on a bench and wait. There was no covering. Uh -uh. And so PSCA actually owned the property, so they didn't have to worry about trying to buy the property from anybody in order to build. We just had to come up with the construction costs. And that's part of the consideration for the Park Street um, terminal in Clearwater is a land swap. Um, Ooh, I and old. I don't think it's completely <laughs> set, but... Uh, that would be about three million or so dollars that the city of Clearwater would contribute in the same vein, so you're not buying land. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Whit, for the presentation. Um, the first part here on your last slide was talking about strengthening partnerships, mm -hmm. and I uh, was thinking about our business community and uh, their role in identifying the need for additional services. Um, I mean, certainly now that we're having a lot of employee shortages for, right. for a lot of businesses. Are you, are you getting any sense of, of, of that push as far as providing funding sources from the private sector? Um, I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, we need it. Go ahead, government, and do it. <laughs> but I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, it's in their own vested interest to, to, to have that themselves. Are you, are you seeing any more of that? Um, that or is it still kind of uh, let the let the government do it? Well, I don't think it's an attitude of let the government do it. I think what the private sector typically <clears throat> does is they want to size things up from, okay, how do I benefit from this? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think what I've heard in talking with CEOs and with business leaders is, if it's something that helps them achieve their objectives, they're willing to have some skin in the game and, and help support some things. But most businesses don't have, I mean, they don't have the financial wherewithal to come up with millions of dollars, but they can do other things and they can contribute some dollars to that. Um, think of it as, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of ways that we capture the value of growth and development that happens. Some of that um, value capture is a big part of transit investments and that's on the back of businesses and private sector sometimes because they're directly benefiting from that investment. So that's a conversation that we have had. I think there are a lot of business leaders who are looking at workforce recruitment, retention, and they see good transportation as a key part of that, particularly in a region like ours, where you might be recruiting workers from New York City or Chicago or, or other places like that where they have good transportation. And they come here and they see that, well, I'm gonna have to buy a car, I'm gonna have to drive a whole lot more, I might have to live in Pasco County to afford it and then make a long commute, or Hernando County. So it's a very different equation. And so the business community is telling me, and they have consistently for years, that we need good transportation to recruit and retain workers. The pandemic has changed things, but I don't think it's fundamentally changed that equation of strong workforce, good workers. But, but on that note, it's typically first mile, last mile, okay, in terms of when, when, you, when you get private sector involved with transportation issues. Um, and I've been involved in several efforts to do, you know, do loops. So, for instance, if we were to expand the opportunity for people to take transit to Oldsmar, you, you can't get off of a bus and 
walk three miles to the business. You need a you need local loops or things like that to connect that. Yep. That's that's really where your 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 opportunity is. And I've seen private sector fund those types of efforts. Um, and but I you know so I think that that's an ongoing conversation. I think we can do more with it, mm -hmm. but I don't think just that piece of, of its but, own would say, but, but it a, is very much needed. That's a great point. And, and without first mile, last mile, this is a kind of a worthless conversation right. because the reality is that people aren't going to use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it'd only be those folks that are in desperate need of getting from right. point A to point B. But what, if you're not having, if you're trying to bring that 1% usage factor that we have, or one and a half, whatever it is, of our residents well, that use. for commuting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to get up to that, you know, I remember you saying a number as aspirational would be 10%. Um, you're going to have to have that that that, that component. You, of, you, of you the, do, and part of it is to make a, a more efficient service. I mean, I think PST does a good job of trying to take limited resources and try to provide coverage for everybody. But if you if you get on and you have 27 stops between point A and point B, What's the likelihood you're going to take that? So that that <coughs> minimizes the number of people that are going to utilize it, um, you know, and that's just a factor of you know what, what we have currently. What does that investment from a, a private business look like? Is it is it a um, is it a business part coming together like a Carillon? Everyone invests in it, or is it an individual? How do I mean, or is it a particular employer? You know, Raymond James investing in a shuttle service. What, what does that actually look it takes like? It's a lot of different forms. I'll give you an example. Last night I was at the Marina Walk Apartments on 34th Street South. It used to be the Flamingo Hotel or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. the, the, the city um, worked on the Skyway Trail connecting in, but the developer built the trail out to 34th Street mm -hmm. and put in bike racks, put in um, um, a bus pad for PSTA, and, and really did a nice job with the trail all around that. So that's kind of a small scale investment. A better example, bigger scale, would be the West Shore area in Tampa, where the, um, the West Shore District has established a property assessment for all the businesses in the West Shore District that pay for transportation, pay for landscaping, pay for overall improvements in the West Shore District. And that's a model that we could look at, potentially for the Gateway or some other district. Uh, they have a pretty robust funding source, and that was initiated in the 1990s. And they've put in a lot of local streets, and they're going to put in more with the West Shore Interchange. So that's that's a different okay. model, but yeah. but that's more no, of a that's collective. A good example. Yeah. So you've got a, a range. Was that transportation and transit you're talking about, or just the in transportation? The West Shore? Yeah. yeah, it's transportation Most and transit. Um, they're 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 looking at intermodal centers, things like that. They're they're readying for oh, they future okay. investment. But in the meantime, they've already done a lot with sidewalks and bike facilities. So the infrastructure like in place, mm -hmm. and now. The last component would That's be right. the, yeah. And then the other component of it is, for example, in the US 19 quarter in Clearwater, where they adopted, the city adopted a land development code that as redevelopment occurs, you get higher density, but in exchange for that higher density, the developer is now obligated to help, you know, build the buildings in the right way, put in bike parking, put in transit facilities and things like that as a condition of development approval. And that's another partnership. And that's money out of the developer's yeah. pocket. It's not often that you see developers funding transit operations, but in some examples, Schaumburg, Illinois, and places like that, they do fund the shuttles. And uh, I work with um, Joel Silverboard in the Destin area, and up in the Panhandle, you know, for those resorts, the resorts were busing people using van pools from um, Defuniac Springs, from all the little towns in the north part of the Panhandle, an hour down to those beach resorts, and the resorts were fully paying for that. So that's a different dynamic because the workforce can't live on the beach, mm -hmm. just like here, they can't live on the beach. They can live in the county. Hmm. Questions for Wit? Hmm. All right. So hope I set some context for you. <laughs> no, thank you. I, you know, thank yeah, you, Wit. Thanks a lot. And that's really what we were trying. <laughs> <laughs> it probably like, could have been here. a presentation <laughs> by itself well, one wait day. Wait a minute. I didn't hear him tell us what the answer was. <laughs> <laughs> answer for what? How you pay for all of this? Well, and that's the that's our conversation yeah, because the you asked for a, a presentation and a discussion about transportation um, at our strategic plan. <coughs> so you can start with with context of the, what's appropriate at the given place and time. You know, for where where do we want to go with that and what's supportable? You know, two years ago we were talking about a referendum on transportation. 
that would have funded because we would have taken that we would have split that with the cities because we're looking at our local roads i guarantee if we ask the cities they're going to tell you they have similar issues for their infrastructure right so um at that point we were looking at a portion to expand yeah. um transit okay, in these heights in these in these corridors that with covered it we were looking at um, our infrastructure and our roads and things like that that became the funding source to do that so we were in discussions pandemic hit that got obviously put on hold you know and and uh and here we are today a couple years later so the question is is you know how much are we willing where where do we want to go with this you have the option of obviously going to referendum and generating whatever amount of money you would want to to ask the residents for and we can put together a plan that would address that or we can look at component pieces which given my individual discussions i you know there seems to be more support of looking at that's the reason we looked at our roads we haven't looked at our roads before to say we really need to increase our funding if we want to increase the service level for our own local roads but that's unincorporated so we'd address that there's a variety of funding sources we could do that only cover unincorporated residents um, we have the issue of a policy thing about whether we want to work with PSTA on some of these funding sources. PST, um, capital, one-time money. So for instance, our transit center, you've heard they do, we can ask the question about reserve levels and things like that, but from their standpoint, obviously they have limited funds. And so do we wanna assist them with a match that would go after these funds? We, they outlined, and I asked Brad for this, um, and so Brad and Cassandra put this together, well, we said okay what are your top three priorities you know if the commission was willing to even understand something depending upon the, the type of funding what are your top three priorities and so you can see that it's the transit center it's a um it's the waterborne transportation that would and ford Pinellas has been leading um and it is the um a one of the uh corridors which is the clearwater um, um 19. yeah the alt 19 corridor thank you um, so those were their highest priorities um, and then you know and then you can see the details didn't matter I just wanted to get a sense from the Commission because we can break that down further phase in the waterborne transportation only focus on pieces of it you could we could come back and say only on capital and the operating would have to be supported in a different manner um, when you're talking about the waterborne transportation obviously the, they've got 40% of the cost in this model on a county funding source so that would be ongoing okay. and so we would have to look at that but again 40 percent how is that arrived at well unincorporated it's not 40 percent so you know that's because the, the cities say they only have so much money and obviously so do we so we you know so that's an arbitrary number i can look at and i can talk about any of these things i can look at fees but i wanted to just put this on the table here's a, from a big picture the need now the question is, you know, what what's the commission comfortable with for us to pursue? And then I can work on these during this budget process and bring back different options, different funding levels. But there's some pretty significant policy issues. For instance, providing funding to PSTA, a separate entity, that's a significant policy issue. And so, you know, I, that's and you know, we've had this conversation at staff level, and so Brad and them, they fully understand that. That's the reason we're having this conversation today. So, this is what we've prepared for today. Um, I'll I'll stop at this point and then answer any questions, um, and and you know, see where you, what your pleasure is. Commissioner Flowers. Question: Why didn't you guys move forward with the referendum? Because <laughs> we would have had to put it on in the middle of the pandemic. Okay. <laughs> we were it was a timing of where it was the very beginning of the pandemic and no one knew what was coming next okay so I guess would there be consideration to to think about that going forward I don't know it's a touchy subject yeah I don't what do, how many votes do you need to majority that's just that's a simple that a majority, majority isn't it to, to adopt the resolution to move it forward I did not expect this question. It, off the top of my head, I believe it's a simple majority to move It forward. is a simple majority. Mm -hmm. yes. We're about to pass the referendum. Is that 50 or 60? 
50 point one percent. Yeah, fifty percent. It's just simple. It, it's just simple. majority on the yep. referendum. It's just the well, we'd timing. have to put it on, and we'd have to have a, a, a yeah. organization to be able to move that. Yeah. And the timing yeah. is now has to be on a general election, which was right. part of the have to right. be on the general election, and we would have that, which means we would have to adopt that, right? Because we have to get the question certified and everything by the May commission meeting. Yeah. Um, so thank thank you for answering that for me. I just didn't know why it didn't move. Um, I really appreciated the presentation, um, Mr. Blanton, because it was quite informative and kind of, I think, for me, it tied a lot of things together. Sometimes when we're talking about transportation, it's segmented. <laughs> and so you don't see the benefit of the full picture. And, and persons get the misperception that um, these are uh, special projects, but they really all tie together to help providing services uh, to help grow our entire community, our regional community because that's what we're looking at regional aspects um, I do want to say I would like to say that I, I fully support um, expanding our transportation footprint um, typically when when that occurs you start seeing additional growth and development and that brings about some unintended consequences when it comes to persons of lower economic status um, in the area that you were talking about along 34th Street at Skyway Marina, right across is Skyway Lofts, which are the 61 units that are all affordable. Um, and, you know, I, I had a chance to take a tour. Those units look so good, and their internal pieces are just as eloquent as across the street where people are paying like three times mm -hmm. the amount to live. But as a result of all of that growth and development, now you're having the additional public transportation extend that way. You know, I guess people say when Starbucks comes, you know it's booming because Starbucks is coming down there. All of the businesses we couldn't get to even consider to mm -hmm. think about coming, now they're coming because you, you have that populace to be able to support them. So um, um, I would like to see us just, um, if we say that we're going to support addressing transportation, that we really do it wholeheartedly. <laughs> Um, versus um, bits and pieces, you know, what's the long-term goal, how long is it going to take us to be there, and then who are our partners um, that are going to be consistent at the table. And I, I said this at PSTA meetings, you know, for the cities who don't want to participate financially but want the service, we just need to have that strong conversation because that's not, you know, I may sound like a kid, but that's not fair <laughs> to the people who are putting dollars on the table um, and they're getting the benefit uh, of the service. Um, for the waterborne transportation, I, I, I'm going to stick to what I said as it relates to um, the ferry. I know that we've received some communications from um, Mr. Taranchik about, you know, the development and things that are occurring there with finances. And um, for a minute there, I was getting some ridership numbers. I haven't gotten that Ouch. email in a while. Yeah. I was getting some ridership. We, I think we all were getting them, but I haven't got I can send you the most recent ridership number. Okay, because I know we wanted to stay on top of that, that mm -hmm. it's not just for tourism, but we've got to see the benefit for um, for those that are using it for employment purposes. A little more difficult, you're going to need several boats to make that turnaround um, going across there, but going up in the um, Clearwater area may be a little bit more doable because that place is closer, but then again, it's funding long-term funding, how much funding, and, and just what are we talking. Um, so good presentation. Thank you for um, tying some of the loose ends together for me on that. Um, and I, I think it's going to require a, a deeper conversation than probably what we would have up here today, um, maybe more than one um, conversation, um, because uh, I think you've already shared with us that We've kind of overspent the penny. <laughs> we got to figure, <laughs> yeah, we've got to figure that out, and um, we're not going to get the benefit of some of the dollars we've gotten from the federal government, which have really been very helpful in a number of areas, allowing us to move some projects forward. Um, so we're not going to have that benefit. And just thinking about, you know, we don't know how long things are going to go on where Ukraine is concerned. We don't know how long the supply chain will be kind of mm -hmm. blocked. Um, some of those boats are sitting out there in the sea that have something as simple as palm oil that's utilized in so many other products, which is causing the price to go up here locally because they can't get in the base supplies in order to make the products over here. So um, I'm sure all of that will play into the dynamics of how our financial picture will look.
going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Jordan. I just wanted to thank uh, Brad and, and Witt and Barry for working together on this. This is the first time I can think of in this county that we've actually had that kind of cooperative discussion. I mean, we know where we are and obviously we need to make an investment, um, a continued investment, which we really haven't done. You know, we've maintained our own stuff, but to look at the larger system, I guess we haven't uh, cooperated a whole lot. <laughs> um, and whether that's our role or not is another question altogether. And how we get there is another question, but you know, I think we're at a point where we need to start being serious about this. We've known for decades that this area is going to start to decline if we don't have a decent transportation system or a transit system because employers are not going to come here with their good jobs or they're going to take their jobs and move them someplace else where their employees can go back and forth to work. They can't afford to live here. We have a housing crisis. We have a transportation crisis. But there's a way... I think of looking at those issues together that we're finally doing um, that there's some solutions built into you know what we're talking about right now but it's going to take a pretty decent investment um, yeah Commissioner Long um, yes <laughs> Do I have to push something? Nope. No, you don't it's have to push live. anything. Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> at, at the risk of being there. redundant, because you've all heard me wax on about transportation for a long time, I thought it was um, inspiring to be at the ARC ribbon cutting recently in downtown St. Pete. Some of you were there along with myself, and um, the woman... Kathy Woods that spoke, it was inspiring to hear the reason why a Fortune 500 company from Wall Street would make a decision to move here to, to St. Petersburg instead of other places all around the country that they could have gone. And one of the things I was most proud of was the way uh, she spoke about the progressive a modern, thoughtful process she saw when she came here of how we work together, how we try to position our values to measure up with the ones that company had. And Barry's looking at me like, gee, was I at the same ribbon <laughs> cutting? <laughs> um, but, you know, in listening to her, it occurs to me that one of the most startling pieces of information I have received in a long time was at the last TMA meeting. Um, I know Commissioner Eggers was there when we had that conversation. <coughs> I don't know if he was as shocked as I was. There's only two counties in the entire state of Florida that do, do not have transportation dollars embedded within their general fund of, of ad valorem. And I found that very, very interesting and curious about how we who pride ourselves on being on the cutting edge of every new and innovative thing that goes on not only in our county but in our state, if you belong to FAC and go to those conferences, you know that Pinellas County is constantly being uh, touted as the county to emulate. And that isn't just me speaking, it's many other leaders throughout the state of Florida. So I think those two things are something we need to keep really in the front of our mind because as Commissioner uh, Gerard just articulated, that is how your community declines is when you stop paying attention to the things we're talking about today that are so necessary to keep our um, citizens with the quality of life that we have given to them and now they have an expectation that that's what we're going to continue to provide so i'll stop there but i think you get my meaning thank you commissioner thank commissioner you. seal 
I just want to mention that we all received a email from Ed Tranchek dated February 15th, hmm. and it does have the operating statistics in it. I missed that. Okay. Can I add one more thing, sure. Mr. Chair? Yep. Uh, lastly, you heard me say many months ago that if we don't figure this out and find a way to provide the local match that all these different projects alluded to it several times during his presentation, then we will not be eligible for any additional federal funds. And that's a problem, because we all rely on them for keeping our systems going. Right, Brad? <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, I wanted to thank the the three folks that uh, that we mentioned that uh, Commissioner Gerard mentioned uh, for working together to bring this presentation. I think it's it's good to have that kind of uh, bird's eye view of where we're at and um, and kind of uh, what uh, what the pieces look like. So that our so that again, and I'm going to say it again that, that that our residents start to understand in their own ways. Um, or what, what they view, what their vision is of this county and how it's being talked about by different groups like PSTA, like MPO, like, you know, like us. Um, I still think there is a disconnect, and you guys can you know, say that we have all of these, uh, these, these discussions with residents, and quite frankly, um, I get out as much as you all do around, and I don't think I have ever had anybody come up to me and talk to me about transit. Other than the the uh, the um, the one that, you know the, the one that zips around and uh, goes out to the beaches and you know the the ferry that they just love. I mean, it's a it's a tourism based need. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't a need. I'm not saying that businesses don't want to have it, but and only in the last couple three years have you know for for a variety of reasons have our residents really started to engage on 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 things. They really want to see and hear about what the responsibility of this board is. Um, and as I keep telling them, it's pretty broad based. I mean, we get involved in a whole lot of things. Um, but this area, you know, and, and again, I think uh, Commissioner uh, Flowers mentioned the, the, the difficult time right now that we're going, the uncertainty. Um, and so I, 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 I guess all of this conversation is leading towards this, this dialogue about a referendum which obviously I'm assuming is not on the table for discussion for this year, but um, I, I never want to assume anything. But we have clearly major issues going on around this country and around this area, and that we need to stay focused on doing the very basics. At the same time, you know, we've made promises in our penny that we're doing, like Barry alluded to earlier, that we're keeping, that we're trying to do what we promised. I think that needs to be brought out. That was five years ago. And, and have that discussion with our residents that says, look, this is what we talked about. I'm sorry that we didn't communicate well or you aren't, weren't listening or whatever, but here's what we talked about wanting to do, and you all voted on it, and that's what we're doing. I mean, that's, a, that's an important component, but I think we need to bring that out again because at the end of the day, you're talking about additional monies. And if they don't believe that what we're doing now is – what we what you know we promised, then they're they're going to have a problem looking at additional things. So I think that would be a good place to pick up again and just say, hey, this is what we talked about, this is what you asked for, and this is what we're doing. It's good stuff, and so I think that's important. And then the vision that you all can keep talking about, um, uh, working with our businesses, working with all of our, it comes back to a match, a dollar match. And that's fine. It's real, and we have to do it. But if we don't have, the, if we're not communicating a, a a a compelling vision to our residents, it's not going to get the momentum you want. It's not going to pass uh, another referendum for another half a penny, a quarter penny, a, a whole penny. I don't know what we're talking about, unless there's that compelling vision as to what it what it means to them, what it means to this area, what it means to the region whether it's jobs or businesses or their kids and their grandkids staying here or, or whatever that is, we've got to get them engaged and engaged at, a, at really in an excitable level. And I think it needs to come, a lot of that excitement has to come from our residents. And again, I don't have a problem planning and talking and discussing, but we've got to keep doing more and more of that to really have a, a, 
I guess, a vision that's, that's right for our area, but that also that we're bringing our residents along. And, um, and just as an aside, just so you know, um, I was at a meeting this morning where they were talking about uh, the food, food issues that are going on. And um, I think they were, they were talking about feast in North County serving pre-pandemic about 1,000 people a month. And uh, last month it was 3,200 a month, and now it's at 3,300 a month. So, you know, northern Pinellas County has its challenges as well. I don't want people to just think it's different. It isn't. It's just, it's, it's just like every other area of this county that has troubles with people getting around, uh, businesses trying to, uh, you know, weave their way through um, all of the different government, uh, all of our things that we put in place, and, and then the food issue. So, um, and I just, I'm just saying that when we talk about transportation it's, or transit, it's not centered around St. Petersburg only, and we've got to take a look at the whole thing and get everybody involved in it. Um, but I certainly am not at all interested in looking at any kind of referendum for this year. So if that's something that we're talking about, that's where we're going. We don't have a lot of time for that, to, to build energy for that. So, um, but I do think the conversation needs to be had, the conversation about where we're heading and this whole discussion is just right on target. I mean, we got it. We got to be talking about it. So, anyway, just some dif different thoughts. So, if um, if we've kind of laid out the penny, we've backfilled the penny with the, some of the ARPA money, correct? Yeah. <clears throat> some of it, and and I'm going to bring up something, you know, at the end of the meeting. But, um, yeah, the penny is is fully accounted for. Plus, we're probably short a hundred million dollars on the over the 10 year period now you can't say that because we don't know what it will actually you know generate because the economy's good um but as you know i think you took a tour out at the uh most of you took a tour out at the jail and so you okay mo I most but you know what you found there is that some of our planning wasn't necessarily as robust um in coming up with uh figures um and then add to that that um uh, that the cost of went up, <laughs> you know, so it's a combination, you know, of issues uh, regarding the penny. So nonetheless, it's, it's as from a projection standpoint, the penny's fully spoken right. for, okay? The only way to add more in is to cut something out. Well, that's, that was my next point was a brand new $15 million request that we don't have. We're talking about finding the money from somewhere else, an, an increased revenue. Correct or cutting a project that we have currently on the books. That is correct. Okay. That's where I want people to make sure that they understand any kind of new request we get of this kind of significance is not just we can, you know, move funds around and move general revenue around or, you know. There is no question that there are projects, not not community projects that we that we put in on, but projects that we need. I mean, remember, you know, we have we have 50 project managers managing all kinds of infrastructure projects and we're trying to get those in. There is no question that inside this 10-year period, there'll be things that we need that we will not be able to do with the penny. It is overspent. And so the, those choices will have to be made. So yes, uh, to your point, we cannot add, if we want to, if we, I think all these things are needed, but if we're going to do it, we got to find a revenue source to do it with. We cannot just rely upon the magical penny. Yeah, it, um, and, and my feeling right now is that the, um, I don't have any great momentum for a referendum adding cost uh, this year currently, and I think if we did it, it would fail miserably, and it would put us further back than where we were if we don't do it. Um, you know, unless things really turn around dramatically. And I know on a global scale, and I don't mean global, global, but on a global scale, the economy is looking good. But I will tell you, that's not how the sentiment is of folks I talk to every day, no. um, and that's what your voting would be. Um, in my feeling. Um, and it's a, it's funny you mentioned the mayors and the local roads because when we were talking about a fuel option tax, uh, we heard from several mayors who were like holding city council meetings to take a position against the county doing anything with the gas tax. Um, so they must feel that their local roads are just doing just fine in their little community. So, um, so where, uh, and, and Wit, I, I couldn't help but notice on, I think it was slide 14, um, you had uh, the on the map. You had the CSX track, perfectly laid out there, which not, it's not always there. Uh, Commissioner Longus, I want to touch the third rail, but it's, it's um, such a <laughs> controversial um, issue. Thank you, Commissioner. Third rail, just well, but CSX <laughs> said now they don't want to do anything. It's, they don't want to. Oh, 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 no, no, no. There's an update. Oh, so oh, let uh, let Wit say 
uh, respond to the CSX question? I may not know the latest update, so Commissioner, forgive me. Um, you know, six years ago, CSX came to us and said they want to sell the Brooksville line and the Clearwater line, right. which goes from the airport north all the way to Brooksville and then goes all the way through Pinellas County, underutilized, very underutilized. Uh, that sentiment apparently have changed as of maybe about a month ago when the FDOT sat down with CSX and they have like their third CEO since 2016 mm. and they're no longer interested in selling the CSX tracks. Mm. DOT was continuing to have conversations with them though uh, and there was like a window of opportunity. The reason for that I think is they want to shift more freight traffic uh, to those lines. I'm not sure what that means for Pinellas County. Um, but they see a, an opportunity to shift more freight to the rail lines. If you've got an update, then maybe you've heard Police something more part. recently. Police? Hmm? Oh, it, well, I know the state of Florida is, in, is generally disinclined to lease rail lines. Uh, they don't lease park and ride lots. They tend to buy those things and then spend money to upgrade them and invest in them. I have, I have a hard time imagining how you would lease rail lines from CSX that are not at the standard to operate passenger rail at a high enough speed for it to be meaningful. The trains go 10 miles an hour. So you would have to upgrade the tracks. If you're leasing it, there's a deal there somewhere, right. but then you're not owning it. And that's typically not what the Florida Department of Transportation's model has been. But the good news and what's different is unlike six years ago or whatever, FDOT was a bystander like in the next room. They weren't even, they weren't even at the table. Now they're developing a statewide rail passenger policy because they've had tri-rail, they've had sun-rail, they've had these one-off projects where they've invested millions, but there really hasn't been a clear picture of how this benefits the state overall and the conditions of how the locals have to have skin in the game. Uh, Central Florida still has not raised the revenue to take over the sun-rail program, although they are putting a, t a ballot initiative this year for Orange County. Um, so, and Hillsboro looks like they're putting one forward this year. So I'm kind of eager to see how that statewide rail policy looks, and, and they'll continue talking to CSX is my understanding, and maybe there's a negotiation there. But yeah, that's, a, that's a tough nut to crack if they don't want to sell those trucks. It's, uh, I think it's, it is the most underused uh, re resource we have in Pinellas County as that's far as transportation. My words exactly, yep. And it is, uh, again, this is anecdotal. This is not necessarily commuter or workers, but... Uh, the people want to go to Clearwater Beach, they want to stay on the beach, and they want to be able to go to the museums and everything happening in downtown St. Pete. Um, they don't want to drive because it is a significant drive. Um, they they want to be able to go to Beach Drive and uh, enjoy themselves. Um, they don't want to, it, it's a hundred dollar Uber sometimes on a prime night on, you know, uh, those, so it's, anyway, it, I know it's something we've talked about in this county for a long, long time, and it goes right through the heart of all the areas we talk about as far as development and residential sure. and the areas of need. Um, and I think that's probably what's driving some of your interest in alternate 19 to kind of mirror that, right. parallel that pattern. Um, so we could wait on CSX and it, we might be waiting a decade. Well, yes. Or we could get busy right. doing some things that we can do no, abso that are low hanging I'm not, fruit. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that we wait on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think CSX will be, CSX will be by that time. Uh, Commissioner Long. Yes, um, to, to Whit's point about um, the CSX and various other things, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, when we, and I was on PSTA, we started working on that Sunrunner line. And considering all the projects that Whit has identified for us as well as our own staff here in the county, it is important to keep in mind that regardless of where we go with what our ultimate decision is, it took us six years of very dedicated, persistent, tenacious effort with many, many trips to D.C. to get that money for the Sunrunner line. So given that all these projects require matching federal dollars, I do believe. Shake your head, what if I'm wrong? Yes, he's shaking his head. You know, we need to keep that in mind that if we made a decision today, it would be a minimum of six to eight years before we would see any federal dollars. And if you think about how fast our, 
our whole region is changing, not just Pinellas County, <clears throat> and how the advent of technology has taken us from, I love to say this, the Model T to where we are today with driverless vehicles. May I just throw that in there? Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty starkly in your face that we don't have a lot of time to think about these things, and they are going to be ever pressing, if not on this body, future commissioners to come. Eventually, it has to be addressed, or as Commissioner Gerard said, then we start to decline. And that's not a pretty thought either. And to all of the people that come and talk to us and, you know, about their issues with all the different things that they come and talk to us about. I am reminded of, Commissioner Eggers wasn't here yet, but you'll remember, Commissioner Seal, you will, when we were dealing with the fluoride issue mm. and how upside down that issue became because of the loudest, baddest, yellingest people in the room, when in reality, they are very few compared to the almost one million people that live in this county. Did you do something with fluoride? I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Mr. Well, <laughs> let me refresh your memory. And, and before I finish, the kidding. reason why that Alt 19, the, the 19 corridors are really appealing is because north of us and south of us, we actually have partners that are willing to work with us unlike if you go from here, you know, the other way across the bridge. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to say that because right. it's true. Commissioner Flowers? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know at our last T. Barter meeting, we, we did discuss the potential for lease um, leasing of NSCSX railways, but my major concern was if whatever improvements we made to those and they decide that they now would like that benefit back after that lease agreement, then where are we contractually with those improvements um, and how will we be remunerated back on that or even if we would because our lease agreement 10 years 15 years whatever they came up with that would extend the life of the lease so um, we did talk about that um, and just kind of kept that in mind I would agree with Commissioner Long we have um, Commissioner Starkey from Pasco County who um, she's represented Pasco very well with T. Barta. Um, and just how supportive they are about transportation. And they right now don't have the benefit of some of the things that we're, we're doing and we're planning, as well as um, trying to connect Manatee, who um, their representative, you know, would love to see some things, you know, begin to co connect us together. Um, so it's a conversation. I was not implying that, and I'm not saying you all said this, but I was not implying that we put a referendum on. I was asking the question about it because that occurred before I got here. So I was just trying to get up on, um, get to get up on speed as it relates to where you were. And if there was any conversation about, well, at this point, this is what we're going to do to try to readdress or address the situation. Um, but um, if, as we're growing as a metropolitan community, Transportation is at the heart of it, and it's not, you know, some persons think of transportation as individuals who may be in a certain, certain economic class, class or status, um, but it's not. It's anyone who would like to utilize it, but it just needs to be able to get them to and fro effectively and efficiently. So if I need to be to work at 8 o'clock, I don't want to have to catch something at 5 to get there. But by 8, you know, I want a decent... A time frame by which I can catch it and get home <laughs> um, if need be so and I know we're doing that we're moving in the right direction on all fronts but thank you mr. chair thank you mr. seal well I guess I'm reminded why um, <laughs> history kind of goes deep so I'll give my little quick history speech and be done we're gonna um, miss that, you know. Huh? We're gonna miss that, you know. <laughs> no, we can just call her. <laughs> I can but I also only up. bring it up in perspective that I'm always willing to look at new things and relook at things because you can't just say that was then and this is now. 
but I could bring my weathered little newspaper clipping from when my dad was in office in 1983, yeah. and they were proposing to put the rail line, a monorail, where the trail is right. presently. Monorail. I remember and, that. And they, that failed. Um, then I'll remember we did a study on US-19 to put rail on US-19. That was um, in the 1990s. Um, I have all these studies, by the way. They're all in my office. <laughs> um, we looked at um, Ed Tranchek bought a train to Pinellas County in 1996 I remember that. and said, let's use the CSX lines. And that was so exciting then, and that didn't move forward. Um, you know, I still feel the scars from Greenlight and from all the massive transportation planning that we did, and we talked about putting the grid network for PSTA, which I thought was so exciting because I was like, that could finally, you know, and, and that hasn't transpired, and Greenlight failed miserably with a few, very few dedicated people who basically were able to find ways to defeat it. Um, so... Today, so PSTA, we're looking at doing a bus on short. So where I'm going now, where it's kind of exciting is technology is going to give us all kinds of opportunities. And we were just at the um, Hub Innovation Center grand opening yesterday. And some of the, uh, those technologies don't translate to transportation yet. But they will. But they will. Yeah. And it was so exciting to see what they were doing. And... Um, it, it, and then Kathy Wood mentioned at the ARC Innovation. The reason that they are interested in Pinellas County is because we were innovative. And so, I mean, that was kind of really nice to hear because we don't oftentimes hear that. I do believe, you know, there is going to be technology. And, and one thing that we could look at is, it's, you know, taking some of the lanes on our roadway and turning them into limited access HOV. Um, you know, we're going to have driverless cars, and that was the whole idea of Tampa Bay Next when they were trying to plan that. And I talked with the DOT secretary at that point, and I said, I know what you're doing. You're ready for these driverless cars, and it's all going to become the new transit. Um, so... I think if we continue to commit to, um, you know, looking ahead and seeing there's a, there's going to be a new plane, I think, that's um, yeah, solar operated that's going to start oh, flying yeah. across from Tampa to St. Pete. And that's that was in Florida Trend this month. So, that's I mean, I think. coming from Orlando to Tampa, Tampa to, Tampa to St. St. Pete, Pete, St. Pete down to. To get you to work. I know. We're in St. Pete. We're in St. Pete. So, I guess. I guess. Just say it downtown. Just say it downtown. I don't know whether to I'm say, Robert, after all these years, know. continue, after 50 years, to continue to be patient. But <laughs> I do think we are in the cusp of maybe some, some different disruptive ways of being able to travel. Amen. Oh. And gondolas. And gondolas. <laughs> so that's now, I guess, St. Pete's no longer interested in the gondola project. Yeah. So. And I, I thought that was a really cool. But they're looking at Clearwater again. They are. I know. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. Commissioner <laughs> Gerard. Remember P Pinellas Mobility Initiative, too, with the, uh, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever. I've studied this more than I can oh even well, count. Anyway, we talked about a monorail to, from Clearwater to Clearwater Beach. Yep. <laughs> Billions of dollars. I love that journey down memory lane. Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> but to bring us back to reality, the thing is, we have... <laughs> is no fun. <laughs> Present day reality, right? All right back to budgets. Uh, you know? I, I, <laughs> you know there's a song. Okay, so here's... Yeah. I mean, the bottom line, though, is we have facilities right now that are yep. declining right. that will continue to decline. We need new money. We don't have the money to do these things. Correct. So what's the answer? Uh, well, I don't know. That's what we should be talking about, though. Not like, These are all wonderful plans, and I would love to have all the money in the world to, to do them. But we can barely keep what we have in terms of roads. So we need to get back down to... Okay, what are we going to do for the next year or two? I mean, I'm all in favor of at some point putting a referendum on or developing a new, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, yeah, 
I mean, figuring out a new funding mechanism for transportation mm -hmm. that will work in cooperation with everything else, you know, state and federal. But right now we got to take care of our problem that we talked about this morning, way long ago. <laughs> you know, you our and that's, conditions. that's, that's yeah, our, yeah. our roads, so if we our could roads break. and even small things that we want to do that are, that are new. I mean, let me tell you, if you haven't been in the Clearwater bus oh, station, it's, it's, it's miserable. <laughs> it's sorry. It's, you don't want to hang around there. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's not our responsibility, but we don't have a penny to put to it right now. <laughs> I think we could help. Um, again, with the match thing, there are lots of things going on that we don't have to pay for completely. And then there are the wonderful things that would be great if we had enough money to do them. But we don't even have enough money to keep what we have. So let's figure it out. Because that's something we need to do pretty quick. You know, a referendum or a new funding source might. That's going to be a while. I mean, well, and, you know, Commissioner, I absolutely agree with you that we have to do an awful lot of communication with the public about this, you know, while not letting the handful of people that don't even think we should be doing anything in terms of attainable housing. Um, we have to not let them sidetrack us, but we we know we're the grown-ups in the room, okay? We're the ones that need to do something about this because <laughs> we're, we're the only ones that can. So, you know, I think if we let a few loud voices shout us down, and I honestly, I don't think that's why Green Light failed. I know Tom Rask would like to take responsibility <laughs> for that, but I think it was a... a a bad campaign and a bad plan. So, and it had it did not have the connectivity to the region. No, it either. didn't. And yeah, well, we have lots of needs up North County, and the thing is, we just can't do them without somehow expanding the funding sources that we already have. Or, you know, can we? Mm -hmm. Were we going to look at those things that Karen asked for? So you know, we each sent us a primer. Seal. So I. That's how I. So I know you have it with you. I didn't I bring it with me, but <laughs> yeah, so I, I, thank you. So we gave you a primer, okay, yeah, yeah. on that. And I think, you know, we, we also have to do the agenda review and stuff. So this does not have to be the only conversation unless you want to go after a referendum, mm -hmm. okay? Um, if you want to go after a referendum, I really need to know that because there, um, obviously, there's a lot of structure that needs to occur for that to occur this fall. Um, and you would have to place it on the ballot by the May, May commission meeting. Um, now, I've talked to you individually, um, but I wanted this conversation to occur. If, in fact, that is not a, a, an avenue you want to go down, well, then I can start to look at these other things and bring you back some options. I can piece these together. If you say, you know what, we really do need to address our roads at some level, I can mm -hmm. say A, B, and C. I can set some, and I can, t and I can identify some funding pieces that would look at arterials, which would be countywide revenue versus locals, which would be MSTU or revenue sources that impact only unincorporated residents. So I can come back to a package with you. But then the other component piece that I'd like to get feedback on, no decision, but feedback on is if we want to pursue one, waterborne transportation. Is that something we're interested in looking at? And again, I'll have to come up with a revenue source for it and or the issues of PSTA and matches for the two projects that they talk about. So if, if I can just get a sense from that, I can bring back options and ideas, but I don't have a clear sense of where the commission is on, on these items. And so I think if we just narrow down those few things, no decision, but a general sense, except for the referendum. If you want to do the referendum, which I don't think the, the um, uh, consensus of the commission, if you want to do it, I need to know that today. If we don't, well, then we can move on to these other issues. I think, I mean, just my two cents is on the referendum that we don't have a coherent we selling, uh, you know, if right. it's just we need it because we're March. bailing water, I don't think that sells. If we have it for a, a vision of a project or a, then I think you've got something, a shot. But okay. I, and that's just my two cents. And right. not just the yeah. project. Yeah. I, mean, I, said, I, I was just asking the question. <laughs> I, you know, and I just, I got I that didn't. sense as we talked about it individually, but I didn't know. You know, and I, sure. I, that's the reason I wanted to show you what the need is. And, um, 
You know, so if the, if not that, then we can talk about these others. Mr. Long. Yes. Um, so, I I'm I. I think we don't have, an, I, in spite of all the information that has been given us today, I don't think we have a really good foundation from which to make a solid decision, other than the piece about the referendum, which nobody brought up until Commissioner Eggers did, quite frankly, and nobody had talked about that here at all. But other than that issue, on these other things that we're discussing, with the waterborne transportation and the Clearwater Transit Center mm -hmm. especially. I'd like to just have an idea of what that might look like if you and the staff were to sit together and come back to us with, with well, this is what we could do. This is what is uh, possible. Or not, not so much an aspirational thing, Barry, but uh -huh. what from looking at our whole entire system of revenues, what ha what is it that we, I used to say this when I first came here just because I was curious, what is it that we have been doing for a very, very long time? Because that's the way we've always done it, for example. And is there in the world we live in today a better way, maybe? I know we have the silos of dollars for individual different things, the trust funds, and et cetera, et cetera. But I'd like to know that before we make the decision on X, Y, or Z. Well, we are we constantly possible. Well, we constantly look for finding efficiencies. Okay, I know you do. Um, and that's the reason the the commissioners' departments um, over the last three years has went up by 0.7 of one percent. Um, and that includes giving raises each year of 3% for our employees. Um, and so we've, we've cut our funding. Um, and we'll continue to, find, to do, you know, find ways to do that, you know, to some extent. So I think, you know, we got to be careful of say, well, I want to do this, but find it somewhere else. Because when I go out and visit people and they want money, that's what they always say, right? Um, in other words, I want mine. I don't really care where you get it from <laughs> is, is really the answer to that. I, I hear that on the penny. Well, you got all that money, you know, find it in the penny. Well, yeah, I got, I got a lot of money in the penny. I got big bills with the penny too. <laughs> so, um, so I, I think we really have to zero in. I will always, as part of the budget development process, try to find efficiencies. And I think, I, I mean, and it's not to me, it's to the credit to our departments and our, and our ACAs that work tirelessly to try to find ways of do things better and more efficient. And with the pandemic, we've learned a lot. So the next phase of that is, all right, what did we learn from the pandemic on ways to engage people that don't necessarily need face-to-face -face and technology and, and all kinds of different things. So we're going to learn from that and we're going to continue to incorporate that. But I think as we address these items, then we just have to own the revenue piece to what we are wanting to fund. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the way I think my recommendation is to approach it. And if I can find ways to offset that cost, I certainly will as part of that budget development process. Do I, can I have a follow-up? Sure. sure. So as a follow-up, Barry, I, I know that since you've come here, you've been incredibly good at reorganizing and rethinking in the way business is done. I would like to give a shout out, though, to Barbara and her crew, because I think her communication efforts have been absolutely stellar. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you to all of your staff for the hard work that they do. It is apparent to me that there are many uh, moving, obviously, tons of moving pieces that the average person has no idea of what it is that we do. And I'm wondering if, in an effort to help them understand, it might be wise to start a, I don't know what you call it, but you know how you do that academy of yeah. people to come in and learn? Something along those lines, but only maybe in an electronic way that just mm -hmm. at more, more um, instead of the yes, issues we discuss here on the dais, just talk about, mm -hmm. like okay. if you're a brand new commissioner, you know, here are all the things that you are responsible for. Mm -hmm. It's really staggering if you come here and have had the experience of being in the legislature, for example, where you don't really have the hands-on opportunities that we do here. Um, it's a tremendous responsibility that I 
I'm really proud of how we all take them so very seriously. So I don't know if that's something that maybe is doable with your creative thinking skills that She's, might be she helpful. She's her head. We certainly can look at that. And um, and to to the point, I, not to get off topic, but when we said before about the you know like the information about the penny and how we're spending it, um, we're going to come out with some information because I want the public to have confidence that we're doing what we said and it's very above board. By the way, every single project, every single penny we spend in the penny is currently today on our website. So people say that you know there's all this magical stuff going on. Right. It's right there. Okay. It is. And um, so, but we're going to make that more clear, and we're going to do more of an outreach effort to, to ensure that people have the confidence that they should have. Commissioner Seal. Um, yes. Um, first of all, since Brad's here, I have a question. How much are your reserves currently for PSTA? Are they fifty million? Well, I think we heard some interesting comments from some of our public at the last meeting, but uh, no, um, I think the last I saw we have about $40 million total cash. Now a lot of that is federal one-time COVID relief money that we're spending down quickly. So yeah. Um, and I mean, that, you, that's, could that's could you number, use but. any of that one-time money for this terminal? Yes, well we are. We, we are putting up uh, several million dollars in match, but we still need and that's why I'm grateful to two of your commissioners are coming with me to Washington, D.C. next week to, We're going begging. <laughs> to, to go beg for uh, the federal money that's in this new infrastructure law. It will be a PSTA match that we're putting in for it. Uh, for that, we're also putting in PSTA reserve money into the Sunrunner line, just the same. So, yeah, even on the Waterborne uh, proposal that you see, we've got PSTA components. The cities have to put in a piece as well for that. Okay. Um, and then are you going to bid out the, um, the waterborne transportation yeah, project? Um, yeah, well, that's the I mean, I, thought. I, I, we I mean, to make it the, competitive rather yeah. than just handing it to whoever. Yeah, I mean, that's how we ultimately did it with the Jolly Trolley. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we bid that out after, for a long time, they were just kind of getting it. And then we, we competitively bid that. And I think we would do the same. Um, you know, at the at, at the uh, Ford Pinellas' Waterborne Committee, we've got the uh, Hubbard's Marina, we've got the Clearwater Ferry, we have Ed Taranchik. Um, I guess he's the HMS Ferries. So they're all they're all interested. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So um, source of monies. I <laughs> would have um, wanted to look at a referendum, and I get a mixed feeling about it. You know, when Hillsboro was successful in their referendum. They only did a percentage split. They didn't get specifically into project by project by project. That being said, in our history of Penny for Pinellas, we've been more detailed. So I, I kind of go back and forth on that. But I, um, I had said previously, well, why don't we just look at a referendum that has an implementation date later? So it's, uh, say, in 2024 or something like that. But I don't think, I don't, think our folks are ready for it or will be ready in November to, and I would hate to put something on the ballot that would fail. It would put us behind again for many, many, many years. So that being said, um, the Afro monies, you know, I had mentioned that I was not um, supportive of spending the 35 million for the water meters and the reclaim meters. If we were looking to find some capital monies, I don't know whether we could use the AFRA monies for that, the COVID relief funds, but that would be a immediate source to try to match um, for the PSTA terminal. And it would then go back into our user fees, which is how our enterprise funds, and Barry and I have had this conversation that I feel <laughs> kind of strongly that the enterprise funds need to stay in their silo, in their, silo, in their lane and that they need to be funded by user fees because typically the airport's been an enterprise fund. You know, all of our utilities have been enterprise funds. And I, so that's an idea. The other idea is um, we have a, a huge, we have a large amount of money and I think it's, uh, I'm not gonna mention it because I can't remember the exact number, but for a new administration building, we could just stay here fix this up and 
use that money for a PSTA terminal or for something else. So I only throw those out because there are different, you know, other meetings we've had discussing these things that maybe we should be re-scrubbing the penny and seeing if there's things that we really do or don't want to do. And then, you know, I agree the Clearwater Terminal desperately needs to be replaced. It's, oh. it's, it's in horrible shape. <laughs> and um, so I'm done. And that's just the first page. <laughs> Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Um, yes, this is this is wonderful. I mean, we're you know having great conversation. I like some of your thoughts. Uh, what you were talking about the you know compelling vision. You know, and then we got it. We've got to keep working on that. I think there was a few years back we we had we had brought Thea in for some of that kind of off the wall. I don't call it off the wall because they do some really good stuff. So it's not off the wall in terms of not being credible or. But they really brought some uh, some neat <laughs> ideas to mm -hmm. the table. Yes. Um, again, ones that I think capture the imagination a little bit, maybe of our public. You know, uh, folks that say, "Well, even the even the uh, the one the overhead, get it, getting it out of the traffic makes mm -hmm. so much sense to people. I mean, how you pay for it and all that that's a, a detail, but they can get excited about that or, or some of these um, ind independent lanes that you know that, that like you said, reverse lanes that go different times of the day and. And, and light interruptions where you know you're it's coming and when it's coming the light changes to give it priority and there's lots of ways that you know we can that we can do that and commissioner uh, long said something about the virtual tool that we have developed as a way i think even of of, of messaging out some of this compelling creative um, stuff and we can package it in certain ways so that when folks see that we the county has a I don't know what we're going to call it ray of sunshine come you know so people see that and they say I want to weigh in on that because it's probably one of those five to ten year visionary discussions that we're having and people can weigh in on on that uh, a little better um, I think that's the kind of thing I was trying to get at you said it so much better than I did but just trying to have a compelling kind of thing that people get excited about. If that happens and it kind of grows from there, I think referendums just become a mechanical process that you go through because they've got they've bought into the to the idea. And so I, I'm excited about that. The waterborne transportation, I do think that TDC funding is 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 a, is a, is a viable alternative for that tourism-based effort that goes on in our intercoastal. Now I'm not saying it's all tourism. But when I remember we were talking about the one that went across the bay to Tampa, um, they said, well, there's vir virtually no component of it being, you know, we couldn't justify any TDC funds for that. There was just no, but I do think if you had that intercoastal, there, there are some justification for TDC funds there as a source of, of funds. And I think that's something that, you know, we can, we can develop. We're talking about this, I guess, mid to north end first, and then maybe, it goes down to the south end second and and who knows maybe it eventually connects around yeah, to just saying so you no know, i mean that's still an a a um a county attorney's decision um or mm -hmm. not decision um interpretation of mm -hmm. whether or not the funds can be used for that purpose yeah. and well, again that, 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 that's going to be their opinion right and then we'll we'll go f we'll go from there and I, again i'm not saying i'm uh, these are just things that you know right. again we're talking about mm -hmm. there's arpa funds that we talked about um there is this 24 percent of our reserves now that you know again i talked to departing omb people the last year and they said probably should be closer to 16 percent i mean because what has been traditionally at 15 they were saying 16 or 17 might be the right number that may be subject to different opinions but it's well over 20 i don't know what it's supposed to be and, and i don't know what the forecast is but it seems if i remember correctly going up into the mid 20s somewhere um, there are pockets of funding that we can maybe go after and you mentioned a couple as well i think taking a look at the, at the penny again i mean i you know, th there are so many projects on that list, mm -hmm. and I am one. Barry, if there was an issue that I didn't think we were doing it for what we promised, then we'd be having a whole different conversation. Right. That's not really it at all. Yeah. It's just a matter of are we are we com com communicating that? Uh, we just need to keep communicating yeah. uh, to our residents to to assure them that we're doing what we said we were going to do. And I think that's the that the key piece. Um, 
I just think there's a variety of, of methods here to look at. There's some creativity out there. There's some, off, you know, some ideas that I think would really get people's imagination. And those kind of conversations I think we need to be having more and more of. Um, and, um, but I do think whether it's the waterborne transportation, whether it's the, the, uh, the downtown Clearwater uh, site for, the, for PSTA, those seem to be, to me, kind of some priorities that, that find, finding some money for. Um, anyway, just some thoughts. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah. Um, Do you remember what we, what you wanted to talk about? It, it kind of got wrapped around. Um, well, I think, okay, so one, we're talking about at some point we probably are going to need a referendum. Mm -hmm. Not this year. Okay, so we already did that. We made that decision. Uh, In, well, no, I'm, I'm giggling. We did I'm, that consensus. <laughs> we voted when you were out of the room. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, um, yeah, I think those were some good ideas about looking at the priorities we'd already set. I personally have no problem with this building. I don't either. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know some people do. Um, Just the paper thin window, that's all. Okay. Well, it'll take some major investment for sure. Yeah, that, well, not however many millions of dollars. Um, but I think we, we do need to identify that ongoing source of funding for the road system. I think um, mm -hmm. I wish I'd had that information six months ago when we were talking about rolling back the millage rate as much as we did, you know, had I known that. Mm -hmm. We were still going to be in a hole with transportation. Well, I, I guess that's the question I did yeah. have, though, was if we did the last strategy, which is about 12.7 mil 12 million, mm -hmm. would we have enough from because we did keep the millage, or is that only funding the transportation? The transportation trust right? fund looks like it's going to be fully I mean, well, it, it's, it's okay. It, it is what we're currently doing, okay? And so you have a combination for our roads of the, of the Transportation Trust Fund, and then, you know. Were you saying we needed $12.7 million more? Or for we could sidewalks. Just to keep it. For the oh, sidewalks. For sidewalks. But so now we that we got through that, and when we get through that inventory, would we be able to apply the money towards the road research? No, that's an ongoing, an ongoing cost. Thing, just like we need roads. that money on an ongoing basis. Otherwise, you're oh every remember, year. Remember, your backlog grows by three percent, so okay. this keeps it the same. And um, so, but again, to the reserve levels and things like that, I was really, I knew this number was going to be big on roads. I just didn't know how big. big okay, yeah. and they were doing that. They started that last year, and I, I've said that. Um, but they weren't through that process yet, so I couldn't really impact that. I figured we'd just address it when, it, when we get it done. Um, so, you know, I, I'll come back with a plan. I think we should use some of our reserves of, for that catch-up, you know, the same way we did with sidewalks and an ongoing funding source, right. you know. I think it's going to be a combination, and I can set some different service levels, implementation timelines, and things like that for you. Um, I heard what you said about, okay, so the referendum's off the table. We look at the issue of, um, of, of the waterborne transportation, and we look at the issue of the uh, transit center down here. And I'll go back and beat up Brad and negotiate and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I will come back with a recommendation. They actually came up with some really good options. They came back, her and, him and Cassandra, really, they, they broke it down into some ways of, of doing partials and things like that. So there's, there's a lot more we can, we can engage with if you're willing to go there as a policy matter. And that's really what I wanted to, to ask you. If you're not willing to go there, then, then, I'll, then I won't go down that path. Um, and, and so that's the reason it's, it's important from a policy. Mm -hmm. I can always bring back recommendations, but I need to, that there's support of the commission um, to talk about this. And since Steve is here, um, could I ask you a question and put you on the spot? Because <laughs> I know how Jewel feels about using the TDC <laughs> monies for... Um, Ferries, because um, but if this ferry was exclusively in Pinellas County, and it had wraps around a, that, I mean, because as I've seen before, you have a boat that I don't know whether you rent it or whether you own it that has Visit St. Pete surrounding it, and you've I've seen it out and about different places. <clears throat> and do you own it or is it um, rented? 
it is actually it is through a sponsorship that we have with a P1 Sports. It's not a working boat. It's mm -hmm. actually, I mean, there's no motor. You can't put it, you could, I don't even think you put it in the water. It's actually land I've board. actually seen a boat There's before. actually a boat that races. Yeah. And that's a, that's a sponsorship. That'd be the same thing if you sponsored like a race car or something along that line. So that's where I'm going. So could you sponsor, if the po total ferry was wrapped and only visit St. Pete Clearwater, could we sponsor that? Um, what I would look at is mm -hmm. taking back into consideration that would be the same process that we do with, you know, even the, the P1 power boats or anything else. Right. Is what's the visibility? I mean, can you imagine and, if they were going up and down our intercoastal, though, with our tourists? So, yeah. I beautiful. mean, yeah. what a great promo. So kind of piggybacking on what? Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Flowers had a question. Um, Barry. Don't go far, Steve. Don't go far. <laughs> yeah, <Barry. laughs> I was just like, I saw you here, so I was like, well. It's good. It's this. That was is, a good, that was a good. We have um, talked look. about these. So. And, and, and there are, we hear. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner, but we hear other communities use the TDC dollars for what seems to be transit-related items. And I've always opposed using it for traditional. I never wanted us to spend all of our available TDC money and it would pave half a mile. That didn't make any sense right. to me as far as bang for our buck. This, to me, seems completely different. Yeah. And I think that with all due respect, we should scrub the statutes, look at what other CVBs are doing around the state, what's acceptable, um, and, and with the expanded allowance in the statutes for infrastructure, which we've never really tackled with our plan, I think that's a worthy conversation. Um, we don't, I mean, we have capacity in those, in the capital part of the TDC budget. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're gonna ever use that, a penny for that for what everyone thinks we're going to, but I could be wrong. I hope you um, are. And uh, so, <laughs> I anyway, I think I think you've heard it today. I think it is incredibly worthy of uh, a real thorough review and not just a cursory, no, you can't do it. We, right. we will absolutely look at that and we'll work with the county attorney's office on it. I did hear this, though, back during the budget. And so we, I asked Steve to reach out to over in Orlando, so where, where you have the, the, um, the, the buses that, but they go from the convention to center, center to the hotels. And so it's very clearly tourist. But that's my point. So if you go from the docks to the hotels on Clearwater Beach and you wrap it with Visit St. Pete, I'm just looking at it in a different way. Find, Not necessarily a, going after where you want to go, but going well, after it in a different every, direction. But it, to me, yeah. it's like if they say, well, it's got to go from a, you know, a blank to a blank. Well, then could we, can we build a blank to make it legal? <laughs> you know, and I'm not looking to do anything illegal or – but – I'm looking to fully explore every avenue of legality. But it's for tourism, supported by tourism. Absolutely. It makes sense right. to, to look at it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right. the point. Yeah. yeah. Well, Commissioner Flowers had a question. Oh, I, if it was on this topic or something on else. this topic. Normally, um, I don't even I don't like know. Here, but. I, you know, nothing's been signed by the governor as far as I know. But, of course, the passage to um, uh, address an additional exemption for our frontline oh, persons. Um, for their um, homestead. So have we looked at how those numbers may or may not impact our our, our, our overall numbers? Yeah. Because yeah. it's the, you know, it's not like when they did it for persons 65 and older for the additional 25,000 exemption. This is a larger group, this a larger a category of people, which I support <laughs> helping any way we can. <laughs> um, but I It'll think that will impact. take it, that will be an impact on our overall Revenues. I haven't, uh, Chris. Have you have you <clears throat> even looked at that? I haven't um, seen a report on that. So it just, I mean, it's just started. So I, well, I don't think we have clear that. numbers, but it's worth thinking <laughs> about while we're planning future mm -hmm. dollars. So I, I have not talked to my boss about this yet, but uh, uh, the property appraiser and I have been looking at it. We're looking at about one point seven million dollars countywide, and then another four. 400,000, 500,000 in the MSTU. So that's not counting cities, that's not counting transit, that's not counting all the other ones, just just those two that we're looking at right and now. And how much is the exemption? 50,000. It's an additional 50,000. That seems really low, though. Well, I mean, there are I mean, a lot these of, figures, it seems. Yeah, like there are an awful lot of teachers and police officers and EMTs and firefighters. Firefighters. 
Holy so mackerel. It's homeowners. Right. It's homeowners. So that's where, you know, and some of them don't live like, you know, some of our police yeah. officers that work in different cities. How do we cities, even get that number? I mean, yeah. It's, he just projected. So anyway, Fat I, I didn't think he had exact and numbers. Probably just, you know, that sounds yeah, but probably I just wanted us to maybe think about that when we're looking at. No, it's a, it's a, well, certainly well, we haven't talked about the budget. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's it, Commissioner Dryer. Sorry to be a Debbie <laughs> Downer. No, no. And to go and to go along with that discussion about TDC funds, <laughs> I think if we had a a fleet of vehicles, small fleet going from St. Pete Clearwater Airport to hotels on the beach. We could also do the same thing um, while we're thinking about doing something like that. Uh, and it would be a PSTA kind of thing. Um, so I, I would like to uh, have us empower the staff to look at ongoing funding sources for road things since we don't have that and it's something we're going to have to deal with every year so we how do we damn it i wish we had that six months ago <laughs> well you know again we're, we're gonna we're gonna develop this year's budget so we can but you know this know, doesn't have to be the only conversation we could put this on for late april early may well ahead of the budget right. and i can give you some ideas and thoughts okay. i can kind of further define well, today's conversation I, mean, if I can include these i can uh, we can flush out the issues of the T tdc funding um and so I just kind of wanted to get that sense from the commission. I can I can try to refine these and and again have that conversation well ahead of the budget that we'll bring to you in June. Okay, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, real um, quick. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, and one more thing, I had I talked to uh, Brian yesterday about <laughs> we talked about everything yesterday um, about federal sources of funding and all that, and he said we were bringing on one more person to look at to keep an eye on what the sources were and the grants were I, it just seems like i don't know <laughs> he was talking about having a person maybe we don't maybe we haven't even made that decision yet to have a person that's going to be looking at the federal infrastructure and uh our money, all that stuff that's going to so, be coming so there's, down there's one additional person because in. somebody has got to be I want us to be really aggressive looking at those things and bringing money down, you know, to, for agree. us to get a handle on our cap, because it's going to be all capital, but I guess. So um, it's got to be in a, a, a different areas. Okay. So oh, for I instance, know. utilities and, and public works, they can use their own staffs just for this and to be able to manage the projects. Okay. Yeah. But to and look then, for it and, and ask for it is going to be a whole different thing. Oh, I, I mean, know. But and, and then so um, and so over on our ARPA group, okay, that that you've seen the the two two or three staff that we have in there, we we're talking days. about adding additional capacity there. <coughs> Plus, though, out in Kelly's group and over in Megan's group, because they're going to have all the infrastructure. Right. And so it's going to be a combination, and we're also looking at a combination not just of internal staff but contracts to assist us in right. doing that. Yeah, so I'm <coughs> hoping that we make that a high priority. Okay. That was all I had to say. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, Good just um, in the finding dollars for some of the small projects, that we, well, not small projects, but some of the projects that we mentioned. I know we have an ongoing effort with inventorying our ex, our lands, our assets in the county. And um, it's, you know, I, I always like to think, you know, we sell high, right? I mean, the, the market is just hot right now. And, um, and I don't know what kind of dollars we're talking about. Um, the idea was some of those would be used for purchase of a new facility or building of a new facility. It's obviously, in, if we stayed put, then it would be reinvesting in this facility, and we wouldn't have a lot of extra <clears throat> monies. But I'd like to get some sense of wh what we are, what we're talking about there. I really don't have a, a feel for. Uh, we have a feel for the, the assets, but what we're talking about in uh, sales. It's an ongoing process. You know, Kevin is is working hard on that. Um, there, it's a lot of pieces of property. That we then have to work with the departments on is this stormwater is this mm -hmm. you know a, a future capital stormwater this or that and so they're trying to inventory all that we want to get there too and we're going to bring that to you when we when we have that ready but we're not ready yet 
before the market cools off. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We don't want to be buying now. We want to no. be selling, selling now. Right. now. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's been a priority. It's, it's a lot of work. 501 building in St. Pete? That would be at the top of our list. I know. Okay. You know, but again, we had we had to have the, um, you know, the groundbreaking, you know, for the Innovation Center as part of that. That's the major tenant. Now, as part of the space planning process, we have to figure out where we're going to hold local elections because they use that for local elections. We got to, she's got storage space in there. So we've got to work with all of our partners about addressing all of their different needs. If we can address those needs, well, then that frees up a building. But that's the goal, you know, and that's the reason we got it. The devil's in the detail, and we're working through that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. That can be some significant dollars, so. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is, prime, is it's prime, prime real estate down there? Okay. Got um, nothing else to do, Kevin. Come on. There we go. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so much on the plate, I know. So. That this was, was a, a good discussion. That was a good discussion. You have in mind some places where the SOE could go, though, you know. So <laughs> Where what? Where the know. SOE, the supervisor of elections is down. I do have in mind. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's this? Uh, and some property uh, down there? I, 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 before we get to the agenda, <laughs> I got one more item for you. Oh, oh, hot off the press. Hot off the press. Uh. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I'll get one oh my lord, where's your checkbook? Okay. So, <laughs> where's your checkbook? What? Some of you have heard. Oh, oh, let, me, let, me, let me get back to my seat. <laughs> Let's vote before he sits down. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, there's been an effort like uh, for some time, okay, for, the, like for both the police agencies and the fire agencies to address their CAD system. Right now, you've got a hodgepodge of different CAD systems. Well, what that means is you've got different records management systems, the sharing of information. Even, even like when a call comes in right now, you know, we transfer it down to St. Pete. Um, we type it in, okay, on our CAD system. We put the information in. It's a police call. We, we create the record. We then transfer the call down to St. Pete. St. Pete takes it. They enter it into their CAD system, um, that, which then uh, calls the dispatch and, and the call to go out. The, it, we, we've done a lot with radios and things like that, but we don't have a centralized CAD. There's probably very few places in the country that where you have a number, a large number of jurisdictions where they've been able to pull everybody and get them to play on one platform. Mm. It's very complicated because, for instance, here you always have people that are in different places. Right now you've got Pinellas Park. Their system's only a few years old. They put in a new system. So why would they jump onto a system like this? Because, you know, right? But you got others where they have to replace their CAD system, and we're in that particular place. The sheriff needs to replace his CAD system. So they started down a path. Chief Slaughter um, help, um, stood up this group to, to talk about, separate from the funding, separate from the funding, of how to consolidate their CAD systems. It's absolutely an inter interoperability and public safety issue. Our CAD system on the fire side, now again, for all the fire agencies and stuff, they, we, we've always led that um, you know, on the fire side because we do that dispatch. And so we, we, we have a, a, our CAD system. They work to create the opportunity to bring everybody together on a single CAD system. So they've been working on this for, Lord, us a year. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's been a long time. So as part of this, they, they come to us and said, just recently, okay, <laughs> and said, what about ARPA funding? Okay. like everybody has, <laughs> right. you know. But here, I, I will tell you, it, it, it caught my attention because this is probably a once-in-a-lifetime where people are willing to work together on this um, and, and, and come together and solve this. So what they did is they, they come up with a implementation schedule, and it's on here. I've kind of broken that down for you. And so it would be about $9 million. Out of that, I don't think we've identified. There might be 1.2 million that we budgeted on the fire side. Is that correct? Yeah, we got some federal money rolling in that. Okay, so it's probably going to be in. I mean, for rough numbers, in the neighborhood of eight million dollars. Um, but and and we don't have to make the decision today. But it it was going to come out because the sheriff was telling them that you know that that. Uh, that's going to be the recommendation to the prime board that they move forward with this vendor 
Then we had to get into, is it federal eligible, <laughs> okay? And they actually bid it out before we had the federal rules, which means I'd have to substitute, you know, a general fund project and use the ARPA money for the general fund project because they didn't put the original language into the original bid. But the idea being, so separate from the shifting of dollars, the idea being is um, if, if we ask everybody for funding, each agency for funding, fire agencies, that it's going to die. It, it just is. And that's usually the reason these things fail. Um, I give Chief Slaughter, the sheriff, um, Jim, who's been intimately involved in this, and all of them coming together and saying we should do this reason. I give them all the credit of the world. I think it's the right thing to do. And I think we should prioritize um, some of our ARPA funds to be able to do this. That's a big, you know, it's, it takes a lot to, to get me excited about something, and, and especially with all the competing demands that we've had with the ARPA funds. But I think it makes sense, you know, and we're at that time where, um, and so I, I have to bring back a plan and all that, but I didn't want you to hear it through rumor mill versus from me. And so that was the request. Um, I said that I would look at it and I would discuss it with the commission. Um, but I will. I, I really honestly believe it's an interoperability, it's a public safety issue for both police and fire, and I think it's kind of a once in a lifetime to be able to align that. They would fully pay for the ongoing cost. And in fact, in, in most cases, it's actually less equal to or less than what they're currently paying to maintain all their different individual systems. So they're gonna create this prime group. It's gonna be housed in the sheriff's office, it's gonna have staff, um, and that ongoing cost is going to be a licensing fee that all the agencies will contribute to and pay into, and so it doesn't cost us on an ongoing basis. They're picking that up if we come up with the upfront dollars to be able to make this happen. Mr. Chair? Commissioner Jordan. So, a couple of questions. Um, so here it says we would have uh, almost $1.5 million a year and add, so is that what we currently have? Okay, that's what we're already. Okay. We're, we're already paying for the regional 911 side, okay? <clears throat> and then the sheriff has ongoing cost currently within his system. So it's a it's a wash in terms of ongoing cost. Okay, and second, uh, going back to the federal funds, I know we have our ARPA funds, but there's all these other funds up there. Do we know that there's no other source that might be coming down to pay for this kind of thing specifically? I, I know they've or looked at we? that. Okay. Um, I will certainly ask that again. I don't know Lourdes. if you go ahead. Go ahead, Lourdes. Yeah, in the in the State of the Union, they talked about. We we want to we we want to pull down any other right, federal right. funds. I mean, I think it's a great idea. Uh, uh, Lourdes Benedict, now. Assistant County Administrator. So we do have um, some funds that we're waiting as soon as Congress. Um, votes on this, oh, right. uh, then we expect about 1.2 million, I believe it is. Oh, okay, so that's federal what you're saying that that's... It gets it back to the 8 million. Yeah. That's, okay, I gotcha. And state funds? No, it's federal funds. But any state... No, he was asking. Oh, any kidding? state funds? Was a question. Um, I think he's being funny. No, I'm not. I'm not being funny oh. at all. I'm looking for how are we going after state funds. Be. Yeah. Because we're going to see the session end in a, in a week or so, and you're going to see local projects like this funded throughout the entire state and I just didn't know if we had even it, thought about that as a, a consideration. This was, this was not asked. And I they, know it came it, after. It, it kind of came after. I know they've, they have they went after funds for, uh, like for instance, the, the sheriff has funding currently in the budget for a regional driving track um, that, they, that the police agencies can do all their defensive driving and everything with. So I know that's it. So there's several things that are local. This sure. I, I don't think was complete. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Long. Yes, and I fully support this issue, Barry, and I think um, if any of you have reservations about fully supporting it, I would encourage you to talk to either one of the chiefs or talk to Sheriff Baltieri because they have some excellent real-life living examples of how incredibly important this is in terms of the one agency being able to communicate with another especially if they're on an emergency call or if there are lives being threatened. And I'm hopeful that by implementing this kind of a system, it will have a mushroom effect on several other areas of our budget, like life and health and safety, because it will definitely 
uh, reduce crime issues and give everybody an opportunity for faster responses from the way I was explained to me. So I am very supportive of this issue. I think it's way overdue considering how many different entities we're talking about trying to communicate but can't currently do so. Yeah. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I did hear through the State of the Union address that there was an opportunity to increase or enhance um, funds for um, uh, policing training, technology, and things of this nature. So right. there may be some additional dollars that come out beyond what you were talking about just now. I, I would support this. The, um, even when I served on the city council, just the utilization of the CAD system or the ability for officers to be able to share information if someone if an officer had to cross into another jurisdiction and to be able to get the information timely and quickly, they could pull somebody over. Maybe something didn't show right then and there by the time they let them go. Then they got the information that maybe there was something in the data system, um, in a records management system piece that um, they could have um, been able to, to get. I just, I just want to make sure because we know sometimes things happen to budgets in other communities, in our community as well, in our county, that may inhibit them or they would have to go back and look at their ongoing portion. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just, you know, would like for us to make it very clear that while we're putting up this $9 million up front, we have every expectation that if they have to start looking at cutting budgets, this is not going to be a place that they look at cutting, right. that we fully um, anticipate that they're going to maintain this within their budget so they're not coming back to us then asking, well, can you kick this in because, you know, et cetera. So I, I, I support it, but I just want to make sure that, yeah. it's, you know. It's actually a great point. Some people point. think that we have a bigger, ch yeah. I was one of those people. I have yeah. been converted. <laughs> I have been converted. But I was one of those people. Oh, the county got it. Yeah. Oh, the county got it, yeah. Before, before, to answer your question, it's, it's a great question, is, you know, I, I don't trust anyone. This will be done by your intergovernmental agreement, okay? So we will have an agreement that will then commit them to that match fund. So they're all part of this prime agency. They're going to have to vote for this, okay, to go down this path, and then there'll be interlocal agreements that will be developed as part of this process. So okay. the ongoings are pretty minimal, no relatively like minimal for most of them. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to <laughs> And there already have been some agreements, and folks understand that. Of course, things can change, and, you know, who can read the future, right? But I think but it's good that we're working together. Understands. I mean, this is what we want to try to do in ways that we can. And it, I think it was incredibly smart, like, you know, I mean, obviously the sheriff's a large agency and, and they can lead this, but it wasn't the sheriff. It was it was other police chiefs. Chief Slaughter is the one that chaired that. And so it was them collaborating as jurisdictions. And so I, I think that just made, it made the whole thing, you know, come together. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> So this would be where someone calls into 911 and then they dispatch the call to the different agencies, correct? So yeah, this that's still, that still would happen, but like Barry explained, when you call in, now we transfer a call and they have to input. This would all be one cat, so Cats, all the information right. would be in there. So it's one quicker. Place. Okay. Um, does this also, I know, I think I already know the answer to this, but this doesn't address the difference in the radio system that Clearwater no. has versus no it doesn't but Clearwater is the anomaly on that it would be Every, nice. everyone, I know I know everybody else is you know, everybody was, everybody else has the interoperability on but but because of that they have they use technology to be able to connect them okay so Clearwater is the only one that does that isn't on a common radio system common radio platform um, so that so this has nothing to do with that piece but let me also give you an example, and the Sheriff gave a really simple example that I think tells you. Um, Clearwater Police and, and a Sheriff Deputy are in a neighborhood and they're responding to calls. Um, right now, the only way is through the radio, which those are on two different channels. That's the only way they would know that that other officer is in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Under this, they'll be able to see one screen and they'll be able to see any responding unit and where they're at. Okay. Okay. So the interoperability piece to that is huge. Could we, while we're doing this, can we urge Clearwater to take a look at their, 
radio system again? Be happy to look at anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that they'll Especially do it. Especially since the chief is a part of this. Part of this yes. whole effort. Yes. This is a re if this is a regional yes. effort, one side needs to equal the other. Yeah. Right. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I, well, you just touched on a couple of things that I was going to mention, and Commissioner Flowers about the buy-in. So making sure that everybody's on board with this is mm -hmm. going to be critical. And it's one thing to front the money, and then they've got to take it for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So that's that's great. And then I think the communication piece and the, and, and getting getting the information in one time so that the dispatch times, you know, you don't multiple, you know, you don't do it two or three times so that that response time goes from, you know, four minutes to four and a half minutes. It may not sound like a lot, but obviously it's it's huge. It's a huge number. So but I was I was gonna ask the part about Clearwater and the and, and communicating <laughs> directly. I mean, even though they'll be able to see that uh -huh. in front of them, uh -huh. it'll be nice it'd be nice to be able to talk to each other, you know, in a major city. So not patch. Yeah. So yeah, so just pass that along to him. This is a great time to be thinking. Have a lunch with the city manager Monday. Great. great. Anyway, I, I would support this as well. Yeah, I think I think I mean there's no question we're going to support anything we need to keep our first responders to have the best ability to do their jobs. I, I mean, to be honest, when you told me about this, I was really shocked because I thought this was some of the stuff that was addressed yeah. decades ago. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. as far as with the radio compatibility some of the work that our, our Commissioner Maroney did years ago, those kind of things. So I I was, quite frankly, I was shocked that it, it, we didn't have this kind of compatibility. Um, so, and it, I tried to clear up some of the radio. You asked me some sp pretty specific questions, and I went back and asked, and that's how I learned about <laughs> Clearwater being an anomaly on, on the radio system. And so, but anyway. I, Public safety consensus. issue, right? So that's, yeah, this is this is good. I, I'll I'll share that we are supportive. <clears throat> Obviously, we'll have to bring this back. Okay. I'll have to wait till they vote on it, make sure everything, and then we'll bring it back for approval after they make the formal commitments. And if I could make just kind of one general statement on funding, first of all, as far as TDC fundings, I know you guys touched on that a little bit. Our office will continue to look at whatever projects uh, y'all want to consider. Obviously, one fact can change an entire answer so mm -hmm. the intricacy and the f and the details in, in doing these analyses matter so we're always willing to look at those and and how those marketing dollars apply and all that kind of stuff and as far as ARPA and uh, the the heavy lift that Barry staff is having to do with money that no one anticipated that not all federal dollars that come through are the same so there's different strings that you have to be wary of and where things fall in a process where you may already be down a road that is hard to double back on. I just give his staff a lot of credit, and he's got a couple people uh, right now working really hard trying to deal with that and, you know, trying to deal with a lot of moving parts in there. But, again, we will always try and, and do what we can to help uh, guide that. But uh, I, I just wanted to, especially as to the D TDC thing, wanted to make sure that we're certainly going to work to do whatever we can to help. And to the extent that there needs to be perhaps a statutory change, we can also, you know, give you guys recommendations when we know exactly what it is that you're trying to do. So, very good. Agenda? Sounds good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> consent agenda, items 5 through 13, you've got the clerk and um, of court and controller um, items, reports received for filing, and miscellaneous items received for filing. Um, under item 11, you got an award of bid to Crum, and so two places, Crum and Petrotech Southeast for tank engineering, cleaning, disinfection, inspection, um, and certification. So you got two groups there, uh, one, point, one for 1.5, one for just over a million. So the total um, expenditure not to exceed 2.5 million. And they broke them down differently. I think one is the inspection, one's a repair or something like that. Um, item 12 is an award of bid to lawns today and and natural designs landscaping. This is for utilities again. Um, once for $480,000, once for $447,000 between the two contracts, and it replaces an existing contract. Um, and lawns today is a certified small business enterprise vendor. <clears throat> item 13 is the housing authority's annual report. For the regular agenda, item 14 is the ranking of firms and agreements with creative contractors. 
Okay, this is for the, this is construction manager at risk uh, pertaining to the jail security and entry uh, project. And item 15 is the same thing, but it's the um, initial design phase uh, for that project. I know several of you have been out, I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. Um, but I think the one thing I just wanted to say, because we had the question about that, when they, back when um, our construction staff looked at it at the time, they only looked at a building. Um, and they probably underfunded what it would cost to build a building. They didn't look and engage the sheriff's office in any of the other um, security issues associated with the project, which was an oversight on their, their so. But, but, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, but they'll be, uh, we'll be able to split out when we have this conversation on Tuesday, the amount of money for security in the new building and, all, and the driveway, plus uh, from the demolition of existing product that's inside that it, the demolition is about a million bucks. Okay. okay. So of the, the, of the 13 or the of, 12 or uh, yes. Okay. So that's about a million dollars. I can, I can have them break it down further between the, um, um, uh, reception center and then the security for the road. Yeah. Um, and so I can, yeah. I can have them break that down. Also. See the pieces. We can do yeah, that. That would be great. It, I mean, I, you know, come, my father was an architect, so I always try to think when I go out and see different sites. And I, I still wonder whether there is other options other than what's being proposed that would be somewhat cheap, so cheaper. So I kind of would like to see the breakdown that Commissioner Eggers mentioned. But um, I'm dismayed that there. I mean, they'll be they would be leaving the space where the administration offices and they have no plans for it. So that's at least a 2,000 square foot. <laughs> and, and instead, maybe we should be just doing fencing that keeps the um, folks going in and out of that center um, separate from well, security. I mean, I just, I just think we're building, I, I'm not sure we're really programming that whole thing with I'll have, we'll have the, the sheriff staff there to answer some of the operational issues. Um, but if you recall back a year ago, two years ago, um, I come to you and said we need to um, provide mags and staff for the three different buildings. Um, at that time, we did not screen people going up on the floor. Okay, so that includes defense attorneys, clergy, others, um, and so there are some real operational issues. Mm -hmm. So what, and so we, we implemented that as of security, they wanted them, okay, you know? And, um, and so now, and so we, we address that piece, this will consolidate that down into that entry point. Everybody coming through, so you can't drive into the middle and then go around, you'll come to a central place and you'll go through a full security before you get into the secure side of that area. And, um, so that but you would think that the people because we went to the back of the campus and you would think that that there's a fence there maybe you just do a movable fence okay that people have a card to use I mean I don't know it just but seemed like they were it doing. was a lot of money to be we'll break it down but that's what they're doing <laughs> to the right that in essence they're putting a fence that you have to have a secure thing any police officer anybody can hit that to take you around to the Sally port I don't know I just um, so I'll break those costs down and we'll have that available for you. And I'll, I'll have sheriff staff here to be able to address any of those. Yeah, I think the operational piece of what's left behind okay. is, is going to be the important. administration so piece. So we can, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, what I didn't realize is this is being, this has been vetted for, you know, from staff and the sheriff's office for a decade maybe. Um, I didn't realize, I, you know, I thought it was a pretty, you know, recent project. So I was glad to have some conversation about that as well. Thank I, I enjoyed it was a good lesson to walk through the whole site. We'll say that. Yeah. Item 16 is declare a surplus and donation uh, for county owned equipment. Item 17 is First Amendment to a public transportation agreement with uh, Florida DOT. This is for the design construction of new taxiways. So this is inside the fence that will open up some of that other land to where they can market that out. Uh, again, this is a grant for uh, those pieces. and. Um, I think that's it. Um, item 18 is revisions to the Elite Event Funding <coughs> Program guidelines for from the TDC, and they list the items um, below. Steve is here. If you have any particular questions on that, or we can address it Tuesday. Um, why are we increasing the Category One funding? That's a lot. 
Don't want to waste your trip here. <laughs> uh, Steve Hayes with Visit St. Peak uh, Clearwater. Uh, Commissioner, um, on that, the group felt as a whole for the major events and maybe some that have not applied before that there would be a higher dollar amount, especially since there's a national broadcast attached to it. And this would have been, bef I guess, in a previous version of the guidelines. I think that dollar amount was higher up, I think closer to 250. It was 250. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Item 19 is an MSTU for East Lake Library, so they want to be able to replace some um, outdated um, storage buildings and put in new. Item 20 is, <laughs> item 20 has a, a, a couple of pieces to this. Um, so item 20 is, it's an award of a bid, um, and this is from uh, the um, CRA to uh, mow and to clean up and mow the alleyways and so it's being paid for out of the CRA but the first thing you need to do because and so this was competitively bid and they are both the lowest bidder for the two pieces to that but because um, we have a person that is on the CRA advisory committee we have to weigh the contract of interest they recused themselves they did not participate um, but we have to waive that conflict of interest, and um, that's the reason it first starts out with the waiver of that, and then the award of the two bids. And both of those, again, were the lowest bidder. Okay. Um, item 21 is the First Amendment to the Fiscal Year 22 Lelman Community Redevelopment Area Work Plan. And those items are listed in here for the increased funding for the facade improvement program, uh, $100,000 for the kitchen at the Lelman um, exchange, so it provides for a variety of, of uh, benefits for that. Uh, two fifty dollars from MSTU to support the um, management agreement with St. Petersburg Foundation, which is going to be the next piece. Um, and that is uh, a management agreement. They're going to do all kinds of things to be able to manage that entire center. Um, so let's see. That's it. Questions? And 22? Maybe, maybe on Tuesday. <laughs> well, we have, we have time, and staff will be there on Tuesday, obviously. Um, now or never, Commissioner Rogers. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Mayor. Uh, I mean, Commissioner that Chair. <laughs> uh, item 22 is, um, is a, a master, an exchange master lease agreement and management agreement for um, the, uh, for the Lemon Exchange from, for the, from the St. Petersburg Foundation. Um, and they're going to, they're pledged to raise money as part of, to help offset the cost, but they're going to manage that, manage the scheduling and get the full productivity out of the center. And this has been through the CRA, this has been through staff, this has been through the community uh, groups, and um, it's kind of the, the step, to, you kind of decide at this point of, are we pulling back and just keeping the lights on or are we going to really uh, activate the center with the community? What is the St. Petersburg Foundation? Is that part of the? It's um, not part of the. It's not the Healthy Foundation for St. Pete. It's a separate. Is it? It's part of the Community Foundation of Tampa Bay. Oh, no. Yeah, Tom. Will, oh. I have Tom come up and address that. Good morning, Commissioner. It's, it's a nonprofit. The name. They just happen to have the name of the St. St. Pete Foundation. I know, but it's a nonprofit. <laughs> it's not related to the. And yes. how are they? Were they? How are they picked? We had a competitive process, okay. um, and it went through that process, and they were selected. And the committee that reviewed the the respondents uh, included members from the advisory, Leoman, um, CR8, community uh, staff. So it was a competitive process. Because it said something about it being collaborative, so I was just. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and, they've and, taken and they're coming to this. <coughs> in this case, they're coming to us with uh, funding that they already raised to activate the space. And, and so that's exciting to us too, so. So they're getting money from the Community Foundation of Tampa. Right, we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps us offset the cost of their agreement, but more importantly, it's part of activation of the space and getting the participation and, and community involvement. Yep. Okay. 
Item 23 is a resolution expanding and modifying the Pinellas County Emergency Rental Assistance Program. So uh, this does a couple things. So first, um, if you recall back, um, originally the City of St. Petersburg received um, uh, EREP funding along with us. We combined our programs to where we had similar guidelines so it didn't confuse the community. We've been operating under that model ever since the beginning. Um, now that was under EREP 1. Um, then the same thing with, happened with EREP 2 where we, we had a new round of funding. E, and, and now the city's portion is out of funding. So that there's been a higher demand within the city. So what we're proposing here is we just have one program. So we're going to use our funds countywide. That's where the need is and where the request is. And then we're also asking that we be able to expand the eligibility uh, for individuals and families residing in hotels and motels. Under Thank the correct... Under the, under, the group, now, okay. under the criteria as established by right. the ERAP program. Right. Okay, so it's not for anything. There are specific program guidelines, but we'll expand it for um, the eligibility of the program. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Item 24 is an agreement with Pinellas Sex Offender uh, Reentry uh, re Coalition. Uh, for the needle exchange program. This was brought to you some time ago. This is the group that would administer that program. Um, and it's taken them a time to bring this and have this ready. This was the initiated by the Florida Department of Health? This, it was, yeah. So Dr. Cho come in and then they're asking that this group run it. Again, these are, there is no cost to the county for this program. Okay. Um, item 25 is an award acceptance and agreement with the Florida Department of Children and Family Services uh, for the Criminal Justice, Mental Health, and Substance Abuse Reinvestment <coughs> Grant. Um, this provides up to $1.2 million over a three-year period. Um, it's 100% match, but this is done in conjunction with the Complex Case Reentry re Program, uh, or, or I'm sorry, Reintegration Program, and a collaborative with WestCare. So the two um, are coming together, or I'm sorry, the ex-offender reentry program and Westcare are coming together. They're going to provide the match, um, and then we do have um, our only funding will be in-kind services from staff time. Item 26 is a grant agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental <coughs> Protection um, from the Communities Trust Program. Uh, this is for the Gladys Douglas property, so we're finally getting the grant that's coming down. Um, 27 is it declaring a portion of a fee-owned county property a surplus, grant their authorization to sell the property. So this is actually correcting an issue where um, we issued a permit. Um, however, the uh, property would, um, am I getting this right? Yeah. Okay. So we issued a permit, um, um, but the property wasn't actually, it was actually our property. Um, and so this, but we don't need this piece. And so this corrects the error, just to be blunt. <laughs> so we issued a permit for someone to do something on our property? It's submerged. <laughs> it's a, it, yes, it's oh. submerged land. Oh. And um, was that a... They did the work and now we're... It was an observation pier oh. that, that, we, um, that we permitted, but it was actually on our land and it's, we don't need it, and so this fixes it. You wanna? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm nodding that everybody's uh, grimacing and going okay. Um, so that means I move on. Um, okay. I was counting on the, that list of properties being more than $52, you know, the ones that are <laughs> 52 bucks, okay. Um, yeah. Item 28 is an interlocal, or, or it's our interlocal agreement and restated with, to extend the agreement with the City of Safety Harbor for the purchase of wholesale portable water. Damn it. Item 29 is the, um, appoint, is the recommendation of appointment for Stephen Meyer as the Acting Chief Executive Officer for uh, Career Source Pinellas. Yes. Yes. And then we go to the county attorney. Is he, uh, before you, I mean, has this gentleman been with uh, Career Source for a long time? He's CFO. Yeah, he's a CFO. And so he uh, is in that position as an interim while we conduct a, a search. But has he been the CFO at Career Source for a year or 10 years or? Um, more than three years. Three, yeah. Yeah, more than three years. Okay. 
Uh, that was not my choice. It was or it was not? It was not. <clears throat> yes, sir. County Attorney. Item. Wait, um, wait, wait, wait. Well, allow me just to say, I put out a suggestion. I contacted Ms. Marchman, who's the attorney. And because of all the things that have gone on, I asked her, um, would there be a potential appetite or any consideration <clears throat> to work out an arrangement with the head of career source um, over in Hillsborough County so that it would be someone who is very familiar with the processes and protocols um, so that it gave us more time and got someone in. I, I think it's very difficult to be your CFO and your executive director. Those yeah, are two, in my opinion. executive directors again, though. So, well... Yeah, no. That's what we did. No. Well, anyway, so Mr. Mr. Yeah. Meyer was the person appointed until such time that um, a search can be done and someone is actually hired full-time for the position. And as a matter of fact, I received an email earlier this morning about sitting down and just talking about, you know, what are my expectations, what am I looking for, Etc. Um, and so I'm. Ha I, I was ecstatic that that um, offer was made, and I look forward to having the conversation so that um, um, there is a, an open dialogue. So I have a question. Later. Yes, ma'am. So how long is the search anticipated to take? Do you know? Uh, you know how it is when you do searches. <laughs> well, I do, and that's my <coughs> concern. I'm not sure how yeah, comfortable well, the, I am making this a permanent deal. Um, the committee, I, I did receive my email from Ms. Marchman, and it said who uh, would be appointed to that committee. And, of course, I would, as the um, uh, appointed person from the county, the chairman, Barkley Harless, would um, be the chair of that as well. And there was one other person that would be uh, on that committee. Um, I have not participated in a meeting as of yet of those persons to talk about next steps. I would presume I've sat on other search committees, and typically there is that type of formation meeting, if you will, to see what direction you will go in. What, that meeting has not been called as of yet. But again, this just occurred, so um, it's not like it, it's something that has been going on for 30 days and we haven't made any <clears throat> any decisions. But... Um, um, and I'll be running the next career source meeting because Mr. Harless will be out of town on um, business. Um, so I will certainly keep uh, this commission updated as it relates to the progress and what's going on and, you know, what role we will have <coughs> on and all of that. And certainly look forward to and would encourage any of your comments about what's going on to me so that I can relay them back to that body. And so, Mr. Chair. But I can't tell you how long it will take or how long he will be the interim. That I can't tell you. Given the experiences that we've already had with this particular entity, I wonder if it might be wise to ask our council to give us an overview again of our responsibilities. Uh, well, under the, the federal. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be right now, okay. but just to make sure that we all are up to speed and know exactly so we don't get caught like we did last time. And Don will tell you, whenever something goes on, I am on the phone or I'm emailing and then having a conversation with him and Jewel. And, and so. get, let me know how you'd like that. I mean, either I, Jewel or I can sit down with you one-on-one -on -one if you like, guys would like to have that. If you'd like to have it at a meeting, let me know. We can do that as well. I don't, I'm available for whatever, however you guys would like to hear about that. Well, I have just offered a suggestion. I don't know how the rest of the group feels. I think a refresher would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. In a quick nutshell, under the federal law, the board, board is the chief elected official under the federal law, and then you guys have an agreement with WorkNet, which is career source, and you also have rights under their bylaws that allow you to approve or uh, you, you're required to approve or, uh, or not their executive director and legal counsel specifically. So that's the quick nutshell as it applies to this. I can give you much more whenever. No, I think like. that's I think that's where we're at. Yeah. Commissioner Eggers yeah. had a question. I, I, yeah, I'm not really quite sure how to formulate a question on this one, but I have um, many, but I can't. Yeah, I'm like um, you; I can't figure out. 
uh, right. My understanding was that the, that the CFO, there was some independence uh, on the CFO's philosophy and um, understanding of the direction of the organization from the previous CEO. So that, I mean, in other words, they, they, there are some definitely differences um, that existed. And so there, there's likely to be some independence of the, again, I'm just asking, there's some independence in terms of what the direction that was going versus the direction that this person um, might go. So there might be some, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, some, some maybe some more arm's length approach to, a, uh, to how it's going to operate moving forward. Um, but I, you know. Well, that, the, the way that they operate is pretty cut and dry when it comes to how uh, Career Source WorkNet, I know it is WorkNet, was formulated. So I don't know what independence Ms. Well, Amir could bring. And, and I get what you're trying to say. I think I get what you're trying to say, but um, it is what it is. Career Source is what it is. And, and you have to kind of follow those guidelines that are set forth as it relates to your outcomes. It's all about outcomes. Um, but um, <clears throat> so somebody had to run the organization since we, and the decision, the reason that the decision was made so quickly is because the letter of um, resignation was provided and it took effect immediately. So it wasn't like a two week, and then you get to kind of determine who will sit in that position. It well, it was a lot of behind the scenes kind of coordination stuff. But anyway, um, so her her resignation took effect immediately. I wasn't a part of that. I'm just saying, if I had been, it wouldn't have necessarily gone that way. But because her resignation took effect immediately, there needed to be someone to fill that space because you could not open the center the next day and not have anybody running the organization. And so as a result of that, that's how Mr. Meir was appointed as the interim. So the options for this board on Tuesday will to approve the, to ratify for lack of a better word, the career source uh, selection of the interim CEO, reject it, in which case I'm not sure what happens uh, with the organization at that point. Um, <clears throat> certainly, you know, uh, I would assume that if you wanted to have a discussion between now and then with Mr. The, with the appointee, that commissioners certainly could do that if it brought about a better comfort level. Um, well, typically... If it's a yes or no vote, Yeah. you know, on Tuesday. Yeah, and typically within your um, policies as it relates to chain of command, if the executive director is no longer the executive director, the, ne the person who's next in line in chain of command is the person who then takes on that role or is requested to take on that role because they could always decline. So the CFO is the next person in line who would take over that. Right. I, I don't know what they're, they're staffing, if there's a, a deputy CEO or a, or a no, vice president, or I don't know. No. So it's I don't know if, yeah. if this board yeah. rejected this person, what would happen? Um, um, there's really not anybody. Yeah, it's the CFO. Step in. It would be the I mean, CFO. So he would be running it anyway. If we rejected it, he would basically be running it. Yeah. He, so the board offered another applicant. Correct. How many staff people do they have there? Um, 40, it, it, it was 60-something. Now it's like 47 about 47 or so. Uh, my, yeah, my understanding had been that uh, we were losing some people right. for whatever reason, mm. and that this person um, might have been another one, uh, but that is, is, is Well, there was a whole lot of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so, um, uh, anyway. All right, so it's something to uh, contemplate over the weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not much to think about. No. <laughs> well. Unless you got right. a, a new executive director in your pocket. <laughs> you never know, huh? We, we'll, we'll see where the vote goes on Tuesday. All right. Uh, item number 30, County Attorney. Thank you. Um, item number 30 is proposed initiation of litigation in the reference case Pinellas County versus 282 LLC. This is for foreclosure of a special magistrate lien on a commercial property. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Item number 31, 
Similarly, as proposed initiation of litigation in the case of Pinellas County versus the state of Maxi Wysong. Uh, this is also uh, for numerous code enforcement violations. Um, we're seeking to uh, foreclose. This is non-homestead property as well. Uh, so similar situation, long-term long problem. Is this the one with all the vehicles in the front yard? Sorry, I didn't hear you. This is the one with all the vehicles in the front yard. I don't uh, believe so. Is that right? Tom, do you know? Name is familiar. <laughs> That's okay. Never mind. On the litigation item 31. <laughs> Sorry, you gotta get off your pack. Okay. This is yeah, I yeah. believe <laughs> I believe this is the one where it had a, a serious minimum housing issues and a lot of animals in the house that had oh. even gone had been deceased. The property was so bad that ultimately the the house itself was demolished. Oh, the no. county uh, got uh, there was a and right. the owner has the owner since passed away. Wow. Um, okay, was hospitalized immediately when we came to the house with along with law enforcement. And again, it's it's non homestead at this point. Okay. Um, the next case is uh, item number thirty two. Again, proposed initiation of litigation in Pinellas County versus the estate of Alex Davis and Andrew Lennox. Again, it's foreclosure of special magistrate liens on um, a uh, non-homestead property. Uh, this multiple minimum housing and operative vehicle zoning, trash and debris, and uh, during the, the process, the, the property owner died. <coughs> Item 33, uh, we're asking for proposed ratification of the initiation of litigation in the, uh, the case of Pinellas <coughs> County versus Christina Leverone and John Ryan. Uh, this was an animal cruelty case um, based on an animal control officer. Uh, he was given permission to enter their residence. He had to use <coughs> a respirator because <coughs> the conditions inside were so bad. I will tell you this ultimately has already gone to county court and they have been enjoined from uh, owning cats in Pinellas County at this point. Uh, there were in excess of 40 cats in a single oh family gosh. residential home. 40. Um, county attorney's report. I, as far as, uh, I don't, don't know if Jewel's gonna have any county attorney reports, but I did want to mention briefly that uh, this week we received, um, or was it last week? We, oh, after more than two years, we received from the Supreme Court uh, their order taking jurisdiction in the case of Pinellas County versus Joyner. That is the case regarding the tax assessments on the Crossbar and Albar properties in Pasco County. Uh, we received summary judgment at the trial court. The second district court had a plurality opinion with a very strong dissent that reversed. And so now the Supreme Court has agreed to take jurisdiction. Um, we're mostly concerned about the language in the second DCA's opinion that has some broad statements about the county's sovereign immunity outside of its boundaries, which is really the main goal we're trying to deal with in carrying this, this appeal forward. So if you have any questions, we can certainly sit down with each of you and go through that stuff. Um, and by the way, um, Don and I um, had a conversation yesterday with the county attorney and the county administrator in Pasco. Um, and he'll be um, conveying to their commission that it's really more of an issue of the broader question, not a, a, dis, a bad disagreement with them. We're actually working well together on bringing to you um, a way in which we can work together on opening up a portion of the land. Um, and so we were going down that path, but I wanted them to know that we still have to go, regardless of the settlement of that issue, it's a broader issue that needs to be resolved. and they have that same concern. So, um, you know, if, 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 if it was something that for, they, they would lose their immunity outside of their boundary, you know? So anyway, and one we, we did close the loop with them just to make sure we're continuing to partner. And one other detail, just to be clear, because it's different in Pasco County than it is here in Pinellas. The county attorney up there does not represent their property appraiser and the litigation is against the property appraiser, not against the county. Yep. So that's another little nuance. Um, I believe we're going to try and have a meeting with the property appraiser and their lawyer as well to yes. talk about that. But just to just to be clear that there's a, a, another 
facet to that. Um, I will have a county attorney or county minister's report. Um, item 36 is an appointment to the Housing Finance Authority. And we go over to public hearings. We got a few public hearings. Um, the first one is with the city of Tarpon Springs, a countywide map amendment um, from retail and services and, and a residential low medium to retail and services. Uh, this is an L shaped property they annexed, and so they want to be, to be con con uh, consistent across that. Currently, the property is a vacant building um, that was a real estate office. They're proposing to use it for a medical office. Item 39, because you worked so hard today, um, we're going to ask that it be removed. Um, and okay. <laughs> this, yeah, thank you. <laughs> this case is a uh, so county um, county staff and the applicant have agreed um, and request that the board place this uh, dock variance public hearing on hold, pending action by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, on the docking facility. So the public hearing will remain on the Tuesday's agenda be, um, and action is just to postpone it. Neighboring proper owners were notified of the request and they'll be sent a letter indicating um, that we're seeking to propose, postpone the hearing until they get the decision from <coughs> the Florida Department of Protection regarding that permit process. So not, not a date certain then? Not a date certain. Okay. Yes, sir. And that is it. All right. Uh, going back to item 37, I wanted to see if anyone intended to have new business. I, I don't. I don't think it, it will be ready unless you guys cook. Anyway, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you recall, some time ago, I requested that um, we possibly entertain adopting a resolution that was being presented to us by um, the Foundation for a Healthy St. Pete. Um, and um, some other municipalities had, in fact, already passed the resolution, but it addressed health equity and some other things. Um, there were some portions within that resolution that um, I also felt we could not do because we've not had the studies and things to preclude trying to approve a resolution for things we had not yet done. So the piece that we focused on was health equity because we have ventured in that way. And so... Um, I spoke with Barry about it, and Barry worked with Jewel, I think, and they helped to uh, kind of massage the language, send it to me. I made a few tweaks, and it went back to legal, and they made a few more tweaks. I did email it to you guys um, asking for you to review it, but I would love for um, um, for it to be placed for on the agenda for consideration. So we didn't talk about it today for a workshop. I don't have a problem with um, if you could maybe place it on the agenda for a workshop at another time mm -hmm. to give you all chance, ample time to read the resolution and to weigh in. So um, I did email each uh, each one of you that. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry, Darlene is not here. She went out of town, and so I'm trying to. I'm doing all. <laughs> so you know, we all know how it is. We get a million things in, and so we really uh, understand and appreciate our assistants when they're not with us. I have to do that every. <laughs> and so I was episode. supposed to send it, and and it was on my list, and and I just sent it late to you guys, and it would not be fair <clears throat> to ask. So I would, um, I sent it to you guys today. I would ask that. You you just review it and hopefully it will be calendar for a future workshop and then hopefully you would agree and then we could move it on for a future agenda but I think it's a very good it just really focuses in on health equity things that we've been talking about and things that we say we support all right very good anything Thank else <clears throat> I've got a couple of items I have a appointment to fix a which we did not uh, finalize before the deadline to get it on the agenda with your indulgence, I'd like to walk it on the agenda for Tuesday so that they can, uh, it will help them with um, quorum. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I haven't heard that. I know, I like that. That's an attorney, county attorney uh, phrase. Um, so if you don't have objection, I'll bring that forward on Tuesday. Um, uh, and it, it brought up uh, something I've been thinking about and talked with Jewel for a while, and I didn't know if this has come across any of your desks. Um, we... Our committee appointments that we appoint folks in the community onto different committees, each one is a little different. Um, some of them are commissioner appointments, some of them are commissioner appointments ratified, some of them are board appointments, um, and so they're all a little different. But if you've had this, an issue where you want to remove an appointment, someone that you've appointed to a board, um, there's really not a process for that. Mm -hmm. And so just think about that if that's something that uh, is, you know, 
you've never had to deal with, great. <laughs> if you had had you. to deal with it, that <laughs> it's an interest. But put yeah. that in as we're going to start talking about how we formalize our committee appointment process just a little bit one step further than where we are today. Or if the person no longer wants to serve. Well, there's a resignation. Or they don't show up. There's a resignation. You know, that's certainly an opportunity. Or, yeah, yeah, you find out that they haven't been showing up. <laughs> the, um, well, that's that's the other opportunity. I mean, so there's, there's it's not that, you know, anyway. Okay. Something to think about. Yeah, good so. idea. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I utilized the authority that you granted me um, uh, last month. The Florida Department of Transportation uh, requested Pinellas County to submit a letter to the Florida Department of Transportation uh, that we supported the lighting of the Skyway. Uh, so beginning tomorrow night, the Skyway will be lit blue and yellow, the Yay. colors of the Ukraine flag, uh, to support the people of Ukraine. Yes. Great. Thank you. Very good. Um, I know That's there's been nice. pictures floated around of blue and yellow Skyway, but that was it's completely really different. Right. Um, oh. So tomorrow uh, evening, the, the state will do that for the Great. counties and the requests. Cool. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Anything else? Excellent. We are adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.